You're listening to the Electronic Media Collective Podcast Network. Yeah, it's a mouthful. For more great shows like the one you're about to enjoy, visit electronicmediacollective.com. And now, our feature presentation. Welcome to the exciting world of the movies. And we are back from summer vacation. Back in the movie graveyard, rolling right along, bringing something new, something retro, you know, something nostalgic for all you fine listeners out there. Once again, I am the GOAT, and I'm very happy that I'm joined by the one and only, the un, you know, irreplaceable Trev 3K. Trev, thank you for, you know, you got a busy schedule, all these things going on. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. Uh, I don't know about irreplaceable. I, you know, I'm only a, a you know, occasional host, so I think I am irreplaceable. <laughs> but I appreciate the kind words nonetheless. Well, you know, you're in high demand. You know, like we have a lot of people that stop by and record episodes, but I, but I, we always have to mention you are on the uh, the very highly rated, and so, especially these days with so much controversy, the highly rated, you know, days of future podcasts examining the X Men. So I always feel like you know. As many episodes are recorded, I always feel like I have a special guest here. So, oh man, how have you been? I mean, I, without getting in too much, and obviously we've talked about it. Um, I guess for the listeners to explain the hiatus, which wasn't meant to be this long, I had to get ready to go on vacation. I had family visiting, and then we were going to go on a trip. So I had to get my house ready to have visitors. That was a little more intense. I mean, I'm talking rearranging entire rooms, getting new furniture. I mean, just all kinds of stuff, time-consuming. So that took a couple weeks. Then I went on vacation for two weeks. And then I got the, you know, full disclosure, I went to Disneyland, and I got the Disneyland flu. And the Mm -hmm. Disneyland flu (laughs) is nothing to be fucked with, let me tell you. Now, is the Disneyland flu, is that when they find out that you made bad jokes in the past? And then, yes. Yeah, like I, I was making all these like, you know, like I had I had I thought I had some good material that I was busting out to the you know, the other guest in line for Pirates of the Caribbean. I had some good Holocaust jokes. Mm-hmm. I had a good joke about, you know, like like a, a little kid sitting on a seesaw bouncing up and down in front of me. I even yeah. had some nice jokes about stuff that I did when I went to see the expendables in the theater and, and you know, I thought my <laughs> jokes went over well while I was there. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, on the way out, so, you know, it was kind of like that scene of Escape from L.A. I, I had a security guard come up and scratch me on the arm on the way out. <laughs> and I didn't think much of it at the time, but within 48 hours, I was dying. Yeah. And, and you know, the worst part, Trev, um, uh, I don't I, – I, I'm not sure if you run into this, but maybe you do because your job is a little different than mine. The, at least At least where I work, the biggest no-no is you can't – you can't come back from a vacation and say you're sick because they don't believe you. So I came back deathly sick from a two... Actually, it wasn't two weeks. It was technically a little over a week and a half. And I, I couldn't call out sick. I just couldn't do it because yeah. there would have been hell to pay. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. Like... Yeah. So that happened. And then, unfortunately, I passed the Disneyland flu to my significant other. So then there was that and just taking care of that. And then... Without getting into it, anybody just Google Redding, California, and you, you'll see what I'm dealing with now. <laughs> the end of times, fire, yeah. and apocalypse. So that's pretty much, listeners, what I've been doing. So just your, your town is like the literal manifestation of what America just feels like in general right now. Exactly, exactly. Speak, speaking of America, I had no idea this movie is coming out, but there is a new f- documentary film, if you want to call it that, coming out tomorrow. Have you heard about this, Trev? That, Man, this is one of those like Denise D'Souza movies, is it? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Is I think it's called Death of a Nation, and the whole <laughs> hypothesis. Check this out. The whole <laughs> hypothesis of this film is comparing Abraham Lincoln to Donald Trump. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Where does the guy? I mean, I guess this is what he does full time. He he cranks out phony documentaries on his laptop or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the, but they're like. I don't know, like they they come off like they're cheap, but but I saw this one was being released in a thousand theaters. That's pretty big. I, I, like I guarantee you, that's the widest release probably this year for a documentary. I think. Yeah, well, he's got that presidential pardon money now, you know. So that is true. I forgot all about his legal problems that he had. So yeah. 
So yeah, so so you've had a calmer um, summer break, I think. You just mostly been working, staying busy. So. Yeah, I had no, I had like no trips to to do this summer. Mm. Uh, kind of a bummer, but I mean, I've been kind of just taking it easy in general, so I guess I can't complain. Yeah, I believe you'll be catching the Disney World flu next year, won't you? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm gonna be catching the the Star Wars uh, Galaxy Edge or whatever it's called. I don't even know, like. I just keep calling it Star Wars World, but yeah. I'll be catching whatever so- supersonic space flu they have there, which I'm sure will be pretty bad. Yeah, that would uh, probably even be worse than like I probably caught like Chinese flu or something. You you're probably going to yeah. get some. You're you're going to get that Jakku flu. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll swell up till I look like Uncar or something. Oh my god! Oh my god! I, there's a, there's always so much controversy involved in Star Wars. And uh, really, I, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, well, you and I haven't talked about it too much. I don't know. But we got to talk about Uncar Plot himself. What do you think, Simon Pegg, merciless trashing not only the prequel Star Wars, mm-hmm. but the fans as well? Saying, like, he, he, he there's a famous quote by him a few years ago when he was filming his role for um, Force Awakens. He said, I can't even have respect for people who like those movies. Now he's apologizing, telling my best, because obviously my uh, my best came out that he got bullied and it really, yeah. you know, playing Jar. For people who don't know, Ahmed Best is the actor who. A lot of people think Jar Jar Binks is just CGI, but it's it's technically it's a mocap performance. It's yeah. even more than mocap though, because he technically wore the whole suit except for the head, from what I've seen on behind the scenes, and he did the voice, obviously. But yeah, Ahmed Best came out and, you know, he said, hey, this is bullying. Or, well, no, he basically said, I, 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 you know, from the harassment I received over the years, at one point in time I was so low that I can, you know, contemplated suicide. Didn't didn't try to commit it, from what I understand, but, you know, mentally he was thinking about it. And now he has a son, so obviously, you know, he's thankful that, he, you know, he didn't kill himself, obviously. But what do you think about Simon Pegg all of a sudden coming out? Being a man of sympathy. Oh, there was a real human. He actually said, "There's a real human victim, a price to pay." In this, it's like, I mean, I'm glad that he's remorseful and he just, you know, he's kind of grown up in his life, Simon mm-hmm. Pegg. But I mean, come on, he 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 can't be sitting here telling people not to be bullies when he was a huge bully for ten plus years. No, I think he can. I mean, I actually appreciate that he's come forward. I watched that interview with him, and I thought he came across really well. And I think. I think it's because a lot of people do look to Simon Pegg as kind of like a nerd icon that I think it's important for people like him to be the, the voices of reason every once in a while and speak up. And I think the way he put it, where he just said, you know, like, yeah, I was part, I was one of those people. And now hearing Ahmed Best talk about it, I feel bad about it. And then, he, you know, related it to Kelly Marie Tran nowadays. And and I think I've always, I've seen a lot of Simon Pegg just in recent years talk about how he's kind of, he, kind of over Star Wars in general. He even said like being in one kind of helped him just kind of see it as just movies, you know. Um, but yeah, I think I think a person can grow up. I mean, isn't that the whole crux of the James Gunn debate too? So yeah, James I, Gunn got fired. Just crazy. Just yeah, crazy. Because so, I mean, you and I have even talked about like you know I'm not the the biggest prequel fan in the world but i've uh-huh. made my peace with them much more so in the last couple of years than i used to feel so to where now it's just like yeah whatever like i don't I, it, why bother getting upset about them yeah but i mean even when we and we've talked over the years in great length about star wars but i i've never heard you be like i can't respect you because you watched like this movie that i don't well like. but i'm also not a comedian like i think a lot of what uh what simon pegg does is for comedic effect anyways that's true yeah. hyperbole yeah. Yeah. But yeah, love talking about Star Wars. We're going to get out of this Star Wars talk. Let's talk about some Maybe. more. Maybe. Some more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> some more shit going. Yeah, that is true. Um, I, I, I guess you will chit chat here for a couple more minutes, but the reason we're doing a slightly different episode today is we had some longtime listeners, you know, always. You know, with words of encouragement about the show, but always also suggesting maybe we try something else up, not just do commentaries. I will fully admit, uh, I am the commentary man. I love it. That's my favorite type. Yeah, of... I was just say I think I'm one of those longtime listeners who said that. Yes, <laughs> you are. we could try <laughs> something you're, different. Now you're yes. here making it reality. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we are trying something different today. I guess we'll probably call this episode the you know fa- you know. Our favorite movies of 1980, the year 1980, not to be confused oh. with the 1980s in general. This is just one calendar year 
I thought it, you know, this would be a nice topic. I've actually been meaning to do this. Such for... a special year, the year of my birth. That's right. That's right. I was going to say, you know, a lot of these films I had to see, you know, after the fact or whatever. Um, you know, because I was, well, I was three years old when most of, you know, two and a half to three years old when most of these films. So I saw them really during the HBO era. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, you were really not cognizant for any of these movies. Definitely not. Definitely not. You know what's interesting, though, when you say that, because I'm look, like, looking over the list you and I made. Well, I haven't seen yours yet. But I was just seeing all, the, all these movies that came out in 80. But then when I'm like six or seven, they're still kind of the go to movies on cable. Uh-huh. Uh, movies definitely had like a longer kind of shelf life yeah. in general back then. Right. Like they, they hung on a lot longer. Like now, if you're not like one of the giant movies, even some of the giant movies, like they're not the ones still playing on HBO, you uh-huh. know, this month or whatever from a few years ago. Yeah. Like the top. The you know the top grossing movie of two thousand eight is not on Showtime tonight. <laughs> right, yeah. you, you'll find something much more obscure and cheaper for some reason. <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, the the eighteenth Maze Runner movie is on tonight or something. Yeah. You know? yeah. By the way, I was just I actually sat down and watched probably like a good twenty five minutes of it about a week ago, just out of sheer shock that not part of a marathon, not anything, but just in the middle of July, Showtime was showing Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> 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 it is really odd still when like every once in a while you flip through like you know you're flipping through cable and you come across just you're like wait why is this movie on right. just the most random thing i, don't know, I would love someone that's got to be someone's job somewhere at the people like program what movies go where and i just think that's kind of fascinating that that's still happening well, like, I, like I said, yeah. you and I have talked a lot about how back in the day, you know, in the early yeah. days of HBO and Cinemax, they only had a kind of limited number of movies to work with. Right. And nowadays they got this like this run of like a thousand. So, yeah, when you're like flipping through channels and suddenly for some reason something like, uh, you know, things to do in Denver when you're dead is on. <laughs> like, yeah. wait, who made, who made this decision? You know? Yeah. And obviously these, um, you know, well, any network, but especially the movie channels, they buy these things or they, li- or I should say they license these things and packages. But mm-hmm. then it is interesting. Like you said, there actually is a human being somewhere who's like deciding when this mm-hmm. movie is, what date, what time of day, you know? Mm-hmm. And just like, you know, it, it it's kind of wild sometimes too. Uh, stuff that you think would be playing at three in the morning sometimes is like on in prime time on these things. Mm-hmm. And I guess it helps too that there's like offshoots, like there's Showtime, there's Showtime 2, there's Showtime West, there's Showtime, you know, uh, there's like weird ones, Showtime Beyond. I mean, there's all kinds of weird ones, but it is interesting that that whole thing still exists. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, you know, like we, like the, the blockbusters and things like that, you can understand why if you were a programmer, you'd be like, well, I can put Avengers on at any time, you know. Yeah. But those smaller films, it's always interesting to me that someone is like, well, you know, I, I'm pretty confident that Thursday at 1 p.m. is the perfect time for <laughs> yes. Skeleton Key starring Kate Hudson. <laughs> someone exactly. will definitely be home wanting to watch it then. But. Yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's weird. And I wonder how much of that is an art like i like i wonder if there's well they gotta they gotta have nielsen data somehow i don't know well i'm, I'm going too far off the path i'm gonna i'm going to d- down the cable movie whatever but one, one more bit of um retro movie news i wanted to bring up is the long threatened and whatever delayed changing directors project the suspiria remake it's mm-hmm. been made more mm-hmm. details coming out I just thought we had to just bring up the the concept that this was originally, I believe, what was it, 95 or 97, the original 97 minutes, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, now it's going to be two and a half hours, and I should note it's from the, you know, award-winning director, how do you say this guy's name, Luca? Uh, Luca something okay. <laughs> i don't want to say i feel yeah. like you know, i feel like i'll be more insensitive if i try so yeah yeah the director of call me by your name which have you seen that film yet Trev? i have not not yet no i actually like it it's not it's it's i'll put it this way it's not really like the best story it's not that complex i don't think it's a movie that everybody needs to run out and see but as far as the directing style i thought it was you know he, he has more of a he has obviously like a european sensibility but that I think will play into Suspiria well, mm-hmm. but um, but yeah, and it, it's kind of it's kind of funny too because um, just peeling the curtain back, I know Bird, who also has not seen Call Me by My Name, was defending the two and a half hour runtime of the Suspiria remake, saying that the guy really loves 
uh, character, you know, stories. But but I would actually argue, you know, uh, Call Me By Your Name is the only movie I've seen of this guy. I would actually argue that he's more of an atmosphere guy. Like, when I watched that movie, I felt like I was being sold more the mind state and the atmosphere of what an American taking a vacation in Italy would feel more than I would, like, deep dark soul searching character study. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, obviously we won't know until we see it, but I, I have like, just from the, what little I know, what little I've heard, my guess when I heard about the longer running time for Suspiria was not for it to be a long character piece. Cause I just can't even imagine that's not a story that seems to hold up to that kind of scrutiny anyways. Right. I just feel like two and a half hours. I feel like in my head, it's like, well, he must be really going all in on the mythology, you know, right. like a lot more mythology and world building about these witches. That's that, that would be my assumption. Yeah, it almost had me wondering. I'm mean, obviously, I, I believe he's going off on his own direction. I don't think he's really. Yeah, you know, it's not. It's not supposed to be like a direct remake. No, but but I was wondering, you know, kind of how um, Dario Argento, with the original film, then fleshed it out with kind of like a loose trilogy. I was wondering if maybe that's what this director was doing, just in terms of instead of like trying to pull everything out into a trilogy, whatever mm-hmm. themes he wanted, he just like turned it into basically an epic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to it. The early buzz has been really strong, and I think the cast is great. I'm looking forward to the Tom York score. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like I said, it's not gonna it's not gonna erase my Blu-ray of the original, so it doesn't really matter if it turns out well or not. If it's good, then good, and if not, oh well. Would it, Would you be pissed? If it somehow did erase your original Blu-ray, <laughs> that would be. You try to put your Blu-ray <laughs> in. I put it in like sorry. It's like anyway. fuzz. <laughs> It's 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 like you know like when you try to put like a region B play uh, disc in like a region A player and you get that message that says yeah. you this is for like they say oh you put it in the wrong Suspiria <laughs> yeah better, then I better hope that remake turned out well yeah no reason to go on this in depth I just think it's interesting for retro nostalgia purposes probably the most other than spawn probably the most badass love 90s comic book character venom we got a new venom trailer and i'm not one of these guys that likes to shit all over a movie six months before it comes out but it, i'll just be straight up honest being a spider-man fan being a venom fan i was deeply disappointed by this trailer like big mm-hmm. time it just it just uh, the only way i can describe it is cgi fest and not only cgi but very low quality. I was shocked by the low quality of CGI, even for early version, whatever trailer mm-hmm. material. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know you didn't have high hopes anyway, Trev. No, I'm not even. A, I'm not a huge fan of the Venom character in general. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, I, I even as someone who doesn't really love Venom, the idea of a Venom movie without Spider-Man connected to it uh, doesn't interest me. And yeah, I don't know. I, I agree with everything you said. The CGI in the trailer, and I'm not even a, a huge CGI snob or stickler, but yeah. it is pretty tough when you have kind of mid-range CGI and you're competing in a world of, you know, Infinity Wars and, you know, uh, the, the other huge blockbusters of the day. Uh, I guess it's almost like there's something kind of charming to it in that aspect, only because it does look like those, as you said, looks like those '90s comic book movies yeah. almost. It looks like a Joel Schumacher film. Must be yeah, honest. but uh, I don't know. I, the trailer certainly was not doing much for me. Any of the trailers. Yeah. Has there been any um, recently? Have you ever have you sat down and for the first time watched any recent '80s or '90s movies for the first time? For the first time, no, I can't say like 1980 or just 80s in general. Yeah, just, no, just 80s or 90s, just you know anything nostalgic, like an old movie you've been meaning to see, or maybe you know just you came across on Shutter or something, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I recently saw Bloodhook, mm. uh, which, well, the 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 long cut of Bloodhook. I saw Bloodhook uh, as a kid, uh, you know, like the crappy VHS copy when I was a kid. Um, do you know about Bloodhook? Uh, maybe is it one of the it's ones? Like a, one it's of like the a horror comedy the trauma put out. It's like oh, okay. a slasher film directed That's... by Jim Mallon, who would later go on to be one of the co-creators of Mystery Science Theater. And uh, it's not good, but it's bad in that kind of special way that people like us, you know, if you're especially with you're watching it. I would do full disclosure. I watched it with Don May Jr. from Synapse Films awesome. uh, in his like bitching home theater. And I think we were both entertained by just the absurdity of it because it's just that right kind of bad. We're like. 
what was anyone thinking at any time during this movie. Just curious, um, is this a movie that like recently came out on Blu-ray? Or yeah, it, yeah. Okay. So the Vinegar Syndrome, I believe, put out oh, like okay. the, the the full director's cut now on Blue because you know you can find it streaming on um, Amazon Prime, but it's the cut to like ninety-two yeah. minute version, and there's it's the full version is actually like two hours. And again, a two-hour slasher, like, well, no, and you'd be <laughs> right. But the nice thing is, some of that extra material is just like so bizarre and baffling that it makes it kind of in the right mindset entertaining. And I, and honestly, I mean, I can sit down and watch any bad '80s horror and get some entertainment out of it, especially in the slasher genre. But, but to what? That's the only thing that pops in my head is like a re, really recent discovery. But to your question about you know, um, just '80s nostalgia, which this show is based around. I do need to give a shout out to the the Joe Bob Briggs last drive in marathon on oh, Shutter, yeah. which I watched quite a bit of. And, you know, that had a lot of obviously uh, nice nostalgic callbacks to the 80s and 90s. So watching him again host, you know, Sleepaway Camp and Tourist Trap and Pieces, Reanimator, uh, you know, even some of the lesser ones like Legend of Boggy Creek, uh, things like that. Um, so that well, basket case now basket case not a lesser one but you know what i mean um that yeah. was that was a that was a great time and as someone who grew up on joe bob briggs man i'll tell you i, I posted about this i'm sure you read it I, I couldn't believe i couldn't believe how emotional i got watching it <laughs> like because it was like it had been years you know and i was just thinking like oh man i used to watch this guy every saturday night and i it's it's been a long time and it was not just that it's not just that it was somebody i watched it's that i was watching it realizing this is a guy who really you know, you, you realize this later. This is a guy who really helped inform what kind of movie fan I am, right? Like, oh, yeah. I all a lot of my favorite movies I was introduced to through him, and then he wasn't, you know, like Elvira, who I love. But Elvira, the point of the Elvira show is to to get Elvira over as the star, right? Like right. in the joke, it's all jokes and it's kind of sexual humor, and she's the character, and that's fine. But Joe Bob would come into the movies and and actually give you this like really interesting trivia. And, you know, our younger listeners might not might not have much of a concept of this. But for you and I, when we were like growing up and would find movies like Reanimator and Basket Case, we couldn't just go on IMDb and look at the trivia. Uh So but having someone like Joe Bob Briggs come in the commercial breaks or before and after the movie and tell us this trivia, that's how we would learn that kind of stuff and get interested in genre film. So, yeah. And his sense of humor and then his just like passion for exploitation and, and genre film really helped form me as a film fan. So it was great to see him back. And I'm, I'm super excited that Shudder's already announced he's coming back for more, that he's, that he's not done yet. Yeah, I'm not even a Shudder subscriber, but I've already definitely, you know, I'm definitely going to, at some point when I feel like I have the time, I'm going to sign up, um, you know, maybe even do the yearly thing if they still have the mm-hmm. yearly discount just to help them out. Because it's like, without going too deep into it there's a lot of like nostalgic shit coming out now to like cash in either sequels remakes merchandise like whatever but i feel like not a lot of people are like really into it and um you know companies i mean and they're not really legitimate in terms of like actually like they're trying to make a quick buck off the fans but they're not trying to actually give the fans what they want Mm -hmm. and i feel like Shutter doing the Joe Bob thing. And I I know the Joe Bob thing was in the works for a while, and there's it was being you know the idea was kind of being floated around to different networks and different outlets and whatever. But mm-hmm. for Shutter to actually have the balls to do it, like kudos to Shutter, you know. Yeah. And yep. I'm and I'm not even a big streaming guy. Mostly, just I don't know. I'm just weird about movie stuff and corporate politics revolving around movies and. You know, even though there's a lot of great streaming things out there that have great content, sometimes, I don't know, I have weird qualms about, um, you know, the companies that run them and just how much they really care about film and whatnot. But, Mm -hmm. I mean, this was just huge. And just Shudder in general for making a lot of, um, you know, you know, and and shout out also to Amazon Prime for throwing a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in between Amazon Prime and Shudder that is, re- I'm, like, I'm really happy that it's out there because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of movies that probably a lot of people like us saw on cable or rent it 30 years ago, and now they can see them again on those two particular services, so. Yeah, yeah, and it was a big month for Shudder. They had the Joe Bob thing, and they followed it up with the, the announcement of a creep show TV show yep. that Greg Nicotero is going to be doing, so uh, yeah. it's a good time to get into that service, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know how I mean. Uh, I know Shutter is backed by AMC Networks, but mm-hmm. I don't know how big their subscriber count. You know, 
sometimes you know there's a lot of startup money in these things licensing so like i don't know how profitable of a venture shutter is but... i can only say based on the little inside information i have um and judging by something i said earlier you might know where my inside info comes from <laughs> right right but i i have heard through channels that uh, amc is actually very pleased with how shutter is doing good yeah. apparently it's it's doing it's doing pretty well and i can only and that was be, that was before the joe bob thing which i know they said you know definitely bumped up their subscriber i'm not how much it did but i mean they definitely saw like a surge for that so well, that's good yeah 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 with these things i just at least type of technology kind of based businesses and you know subscription based things they usually take time and shutter's mm-hmm. been around for a few years it's not like a fly by night come out of nowhere thing it's been around a couple of years at least but but you know you always wonder you know takes a lot of money to and you know invest in these things set them up you always wonder you know sometimes yeah. it takes years and years to get them to even break even so like not only do i hope shutter does well but i hope they um continue to do more original stuff you know what i think helps shutter a lot uh not to make this episode of shutter commercial <laughs> but if they want to sponsor us yeah, uh, right <laughs> but uh i think they came right out of the gate with you know because you and i you know, we've talked a lot about how netflix used to have a really good movie selection and now it's just gone to pot you know yeah. and amazon has a better one but obviously amazon is funded by being a affiliated with Amazon. So, right. you know, they can, of course, have a great selection. But Shudder came out of the gate with, like, because I got it pretty early on, and right off the bat, they had, you know, a lot of Argento stuff on there and a lot of, like, classic titles. And, you know, again, that's the AMC connection. They were able to have some classics on there. And I think what will keep Shudder relevant is that in a generation where physical media is kind of going away more and more, mm. it's... If for horror fans in particular, it's expensive to be a horror fan now because all the horror movies that you love and you and you want to own, it's true that I want to own them, but they're all being put out in these like cool special editions, which is nice, but that means great, I got to buy another $35 right. restaurant Blu-ray or uh, you know, $40 Scream Factory or Vinegar Syndrome, Synapse, you know, you can't get them all, but it's nice to know that the ones I don't have to own, a lot of those are just floating around there on shutter so it seems like it's a it's a worthy system that or uh service to have because there's always a lot of good titles on there and i always find something to watch and i don't have to go out and buy the blu-ray because i know it's there for me no I, i'm exactly with you and even though i'm somebody who has a huge movie collection and i spend a lot of money on movies you know i only I only have so much and i try to budget myself to be reasonable you know a certain dollar amount yeah you know per month and uh mm-hmm. yeah i know exactly what you mean it's like you it's like you don't have a problem buying all these things and the, and it's great that we mm-hmm. have screen factory and vinegar syndrome just all these things out there and you know things like synapse obviously which have been around forever but we can't afford them all <laughs> yeah I, I mean i just i just literally recently made that call to where that new like uh, arrow big special edition of basket case came out yeah. and i like basket case but i was like man do i like it enough because i buy so many of these do i need that one and then I, I legitimately thought to myself like oh it's streaming on shutter yeah. uh i know it'll be on shutter for a while because it's part of the joe bob thing so i can even i can watch it just as its own thing on shutter or i can watch it with joe bob hosting it which is what i would probably do anyways yeah. so i kind of don't need that blu-ray right now so i just yeah. held off yeah I mean, it's it's funny, too, because, you know, we always, a couple years ago, things looked bleak in terms of physical media, you know, before kind of all these sub-licenser pops up, these releasing mm-hmm. companies. It really looked like stuff was going to kind of be lost forever. Yeah. Because none of the studios, just because of business reasons, is not worth it for them. A lot of studios really were like, no more catalog releases. Like, about four years ago, they were like, no more catalog releases. And then, you know, all these, you know, obviously Shout Factory's been around forever, but then they did the Scream Factory thing, and then Twilight Time popped up, and then Vinegar Syndrome popped up, and then Synapse, which has always done great cult stuff. Like, they've been putting out some bigger titles, too. So it's like, I feel like we have a nice mix now of, Mm -hmm. to me, the streaming side of it, it kind of replaces a little bit what we had in the video store era. Yeah, but also there's still a nice selection. If you want to be a collector, if you have the money to be a collector, uh, you can do that as well. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's a good time. I I recently, you know, we were talking about this a little bit. I don't know how this movie, you know, unless maybe I saw it on cable a million years ago and forgot about it, but I never saw the movie Mutant starring 
mm-hmm. uh, Wings Hauser, and uh, I I actually bought it as kind of like a throw in. I was ordering a um, a movie, and I knew it wasn't a great movie, but I was ordering a movie from a re- very uh, small distributor. And then they also carried Code Red stuff, and Code Red had put out Mutant. And um, Code Red stuff is usually pretty pricey, but I saw Mutant was like, I believe it was like seventeen bucks, and I was like, yeah, that's that's you know seventeen bucks. It's not a lot of money, but it's not chump change either. I was like, I'll take a chance, and I'm glad I did because I love Mutant. I thought it was just you know basically people never seen Mutant. If, it, it, don't be scared off by the cover because it looks like it's going to be like one of those crappy early 80s alien ripoffs. It's like a small town and there's like literally an alien looking creature on it, but there's no aliens in it at all. That was just kind of like a hokum poster move, I guess. But it's just about a town of people becoming zombies because of toxic waste dump. And it's just, it's just I love it, man. It just ratchets it up till the end till there's literally just, you know, I, I love kind of those invasion of the body snatcher type of films, Trev. Mm-hmm. Where it's like you start out with a handful of main characters and it kind of gets whittled down to like two or three people at the end. And there's just hordes of, you know, overtaking mindless zombies clawing at them, trying to get at them, trying to kill them. So yeah. yeah, Mutant really scratched that itch for me. So 1984's Mutant starring Wings Hauser. Check it out if you can. And I know there's a lot of DVD releases of it too, so maybe you can rent or get the DVD for cheap. And honestly, anytime you have time to uh, a chance to check out a Wings Hauser movie, just go for it. Yeah. Because because you Wings told Hauser's me awesome. I, yeah you told me about Nightmare at Noon, and now I'm chomping mm-hmm. at the bit to get that. So yeah. So yeah. So I guess we'll go ahead and we'll dive into the the main entree if you will tonight's show talking about our favorite movies of the of 1980 the year 1980 yeah and i i came up with the, you're probably expecting us each to do a top 10 i kind of came up with a fucked up <laughs> format for this so if you don't like the format blame me it's not trev's fault um <laughs> but but i but you know i said let's let's narrow our top whatever just to five movies and then let's pick three movies that we didn't like of 1980. So kind of like a best and worst list. Um, and then let's also pick uh, one or two movies that we've never seen from 1980, but just always been on your list. Always want to see that movie. So, yeah, that's going to be the format for tonight's show. So in a weird way, we kind of each do have a top ten, but it's of mixed categories. It's not just all. Yeah. And I got and before I, we, just yeah. just before we jump into that, I thought I thought it might be interesting if because uh, uh, I'm sure you and I both referenced Wikipedia for this. To oh get, yeah. you know, oh yes, list. <laughs> extensively. And, uh, and I noticed that they were on there. There was like some notable events that they had too. Yeah. And I thought it might be interesting because if we're going to pro- profile the year, I thought it might be interesting to just point out a couple of the ones I thought were very interesting for this year because you know we're we're talking about this year in cinema. Um, so I mean, just to point out some things that happened in 1980, uh, April 29th, uh, Alfred Hitchcock passed away in. 1980 uh it was at the age of 80 oddly enough and so that was definitely like the end of you know an era for cinema and then to that same regard uh, another thing about you know I, I, you and i both love the 80s clearly Absolutely. but one certainly bad thing for cinema that happened in the 80s is november 19th is when heaven's gate was released oh yeah which would go on to be one of the biggest box office bombs of all time and really changed the way hollywood does business and the kind of control uh, you know, p- directors and producers were allowed over their own film. Well, especially directors, right? Director-driven projects really took a hit after Heaven's Gate. So a lot of the, uh, you know, <laughs> a lot of the junk we have today can still somewhat be traced back to that. But, that is true. The the, yeah. the the And obviously the studios in the 80s were m- much, they were corporations, but they were much smaller corporations, I guess mm-hmm. I can say, than they are now. But yeah, like that really, I mean, there's entire books and documentaries about that time period uh, and the kind of the fall of Heaven's Gate and what happened, you know, and the kind of death of the auteur, uh, you know, auteur, auteur era. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And for all of of those who have always heard of just Heaven's Gate is nothing but just being this insufferable bomb. um, Go back and watch it. It's actually not that bad of a movie. (laughs) It just kind of—I think it just kind of hit at the wrong time or something, you yeah. know. It is a little—it's a little long in the tooth, but it's—it's it's certainly not, uh, you know. The reputation makes it sound like some kind of dreadful thing to sit through, but that's not right. the problem, actually. But I mean, I—I I think you know anybody who's a film fan knows that sometimes you can have a pretty decent movie, and if it comes out at the wrong time, mm-hmm. you know, history kind of writes itself. It's like Ishtar, right? Ishtar is not yeah. great, but it's not 
a, no. a bad movie either, you know. I, I look back at this stuff, you know, I can't remember exactly how much it cost, but do you remember, Trev, uh, like, you know, all the Ishtar bad press? Oh, my God, the most expensive movie ever made, $42 million. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> yeah. It's like some of these uh, studios now, they wouldn't even think of uh, making a $42 million movie because they would consider it to be like too low budget to compete in the marketplace. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, I guess we'll start. We'll roll down. I get you. You want to how you want to do it, Trev? You want to do I'll do one. You do one. Or do you want to run yeah, through all of your. Course. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Back and forth. Yeah. Well, I'll get this started. I'll try to set the tone for this a little bit. And I want to say these are not what we think are the, you know, or at least I'll say that for my list, and I think you'll probably be along this trip. These are, you know, just being a nostalgic show, these are sentimental favorites close to our heart. And um, not necessarily the absolute best five, best written, best directed, best acted movies. These are just movies, you know, that us, you know, have watched many times, you know, really um really like you know and really come back to and over and this was really hard you know and then i started doubting myself on the format because it was really hard for me to get down to my five and i had to throw out some movies that i really absolutely love but i kind of based it on what are movies that i was obsessed with for years and years like I, I bought the copy of it i watched it over and over i can't get enough of it i still like it to this day so if my you know list seems a little suspect to folks i'll just preface it by saying that so I'm going to start out number five, and you, you know, doing the research. I thought this movie was a little bit older than this, but oh, first of all, I should, I should say I'm also very dumb because I couldn't wait to do this episode because I was going to talk about how much I loved the 1980 film Dracula starring Frank Langella, and then I looked it up and realized <laughs> Dracula came out in 1979. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, so yeah so so no dracula on this list i guess i guess we'll have to go back in time if i want to talk about dracula and do a 1979 show but uh number five on my list um not a movie i grew up with because it was rare and controversial and i saw it i don't know probably 15 years ago and i watched it many times since and it's still a lot of it has to do with the soundtrack to it, too. It keeps coming back to me, and I just love it so much. But number five on my list is, Trev, is uh, Cannibal Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, you know, I don't think it's technically, maybe it is, but it's kind of widely, loosely known, I guess, as being the first found footage movie about some people who go into the Amazon encounter, um, you know, uh, flesh-eating cannibal tribes, uh, the movie is very notorious for having real life animal slaughter in it. Some animals get chopped up and eaten, you know. Um, but I just really like this. I found this movie actually to be really effective. And it's still kind of, you know, you know, I've seen it at least six times now. I've owned a DVD of it for many years. And I, it's kind of one I show to people, you know, expose people. And I also have some great memories around that, too. You know, watching it with other people to, to being their first time, seeing what their reaction is. Great movie to drink beer to and watch. Um, but, yeah, just gory, relentless. I think it's actually, you know, I mean, some people might look at it and see it schlocky. But for some of these types of films at this time, I actually think it's, it's really competently and stylishly directed, even though it is technically kind of like a found footage film. So, yeah, I actually have Cannibal Holocaust on my list, Trev. Yeah, no, I flirted around with that one. Um, I agree. That's, that movie is still, I think, really actually kind of haunting. Uh, yeah. And uh, I went through a huge phase where I was really into all those Italian cannibal movies. And then that kind of passed, and I'm a little over it nowadays. But the one that I still come back to is certainly that one. It's it's by yeah. far the, the best one, the best made one. That score, like you said, is is beautiful. Oh, uh, that that main awesome. theme, man. Yeah. It doesn't even sound like a theme that should be in a cannibal movie. Right? No, it was it such doesn't. a good it's piece so of music. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it's just it's such an intense movie. Now, it, I I understand when people don't like it, and I can't, you know, I'm not going to put up a strong defense that you should enjoy it because it's a very unpleasant film. And I will say, even I today, I'm as someone who's seen it, you know, more than once. I'm glad that the DVD I own has the animal cruelty free version that skips those scenes, which is the way I choose to watch it now. Because I've seen them. I do think if you're going to see it for the first time, watch the full thing because I just think you owe it to yourself to see what the director was intending. But I can kind of live without seeing that stuff again. Uh, but, yeah, no, it's a it's a really powerful film. And 
Yeah, one of the first found footage and still one of the best. Yeah, by far. So what's number five on your list, Trev? Uh, so number five on my list comes from one of my favorite directors, and this is one of his, uh, you know, I think I think a lot of people say this is his best film. I, I wouldn't go that far, but it's definitely uh, an, a strange outlier in his career, and that's David Lynch's The Elephant Man. Mm-hmm. Um you know, various. It's again. You look at his whole filmography, and there's a couple ones that stick out. You're like, well, that's really interesting that he got to do that. And Elephant Man is certainly one of them. Especially that's one of his that was a huge critical and commercial success. Was nominated for Best Picture. He got a Best Director nomination. Um, it's black and white, true story about John Merrick, who is a, a deformed man who lived in 19th century London, played by John Hurt. And the film kind of follows him as he goes through his life, kind of you know. Uh, bullied by many, but finding, you know, some who see the uh, the potential in him as a person and as someone to make money off of both together with a, a great performance by uh, Anthony Hopkins as well. And you also have, uh, you know, Anne Bancroft and, and John Gilgood in there. Um, just a really beautiful movie. The, the black and white film uh, filming or uh, cinematography is just so lush and gorgeous. It really has this kind of old classic uh, romantic and horror kind of feel to it. Uh, oddly enough, brought to David Lynch by Mel Brooks, which a lot of people forget. You know, people, t- today I think everyone just primarily thinks of Mel Brooks as just the com- the comic director of Blazing Saddles and Spaceballs and all those. But we have to forget and remember he was also like a really, really smart and kind of brave producer right. who who took a chance on David Lynch for this film and it paid off. And uh, yeah, I, it's it's. I think people sometimes forget it's a Lynch film because it just doesn't feel as, as, you know, it's not surreal. It's not crazy like a lot of his stuff. But at the same time, it's definitely a Lynch film because he loves making movies about outsiders. And this this kind of hit on that. And it showed his sweeter side in a way. And so I, I, I really love this one. Yeah, it really, and like you said, a lot of people don't maybe associate it like immediately when they think of David Lynch. And uh, I think it really... I don't know. I I think it 100% is David Lynch like you said, but I mm-hmm. but I think it kind of takes people back that the for lack of a better term and you know some people will think this is a negative, I don't say it, but it really does come off as something that when you see it it's it's so naturally shot and acted and edited like it really comes off as a, a you know an academy award level film and it's uh, you know and that's not usually you know so many people have such a connotation with lynch as just being some whack job guy you know what i mean who like <laughs> who just like films like dennis hopper going nuts and jerking off you know what i mean like <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I just think, and, and I, I, I guess I have a weird introduction to Elephant Man, and Elephant Man almost did make my list as well. If we would have done just a straight top ten list, it would have been on there for sure. But I just have a weird introduction with it because I was introduced to it, you know, on cable and just the title Elephant Man. You know, I always like, like to me, you know, the the John Merrick character. It was just like. I don't know, like, to me, it was almost like a superhero film in a weird way, because, like, you know, you curry so much favor with him, it, it, but, like, you know, as a kid, like, anything that's different is, like, cool and interesting and exotic, you know, so, so you know, the, the thing that, like, you know, and I guess also being a kid, too, seeing this on cable, probably at the age of five or six, not really fully comprehending what it was about like you know to me like the elephant man was like somebody special and somebody you know prestigious and you know like mm-hmm. you know he performs in the in, in the you know the, uh, the 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 on stage act and all that like i mean you know obviously there's the parts where he's getting bullied and shit but um yeah like you know for like and also there was a lot of weird stuff in the 80s about the elephant man's remains and michael jackson so to me i mean the elephant man was like this big celebrity it wasn't just a a guy with just a deformity so yeah mm-hmm. and obviously <laughs> watching the movie again when i was older you know i take the movie in much more context but i always I always think back you know on my weird kind of introduction to the elephant man and my initial impression of it <laughs> so yeah so okay again this is the last movie on, on my list where i'm going to apologize for a little bit um this is by no means a great movie movie onto itself. It's just a movie that I was fascinated with. Um, it's a mockumentary about a band that I was very into. 
in a certain period in my life, so I, you know, end up getting this movie and buying a VHS of it and watching it 20, 30 times, literally. Uh, and I thought this is another one that I thought was much older than 1980, but I'm talking about the great rock and roll swindle. Have you ever seen this, Trev? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is going to be a left field pick from Trev's point of view. But yeah, so just to break this down, this is actually a movie made by, the, I guess, the manager of the Sex Pistols mm -hmm. um, after, you know, actually way after, years later, really, their breakup and disintegration. And it's kind of a weird mockumentary where he kind of tries to narrate and take credit for it all and act like, you know, all the controversy that the uh, Sex Pistols caused was all this elaborate plan on him to make, you know, from him to make money and stuff. And... um and basically, you just get a lot of weird, loose, disjointed musical numbers and just weird recreations of things. And it's also weird, too, because, like, like, Johnny Rotten has no involvement in this film, the lead singer for the Sex Pistols. It's just really weird and bizarre, but it was really more the format and the concept. And obviously, I love the Sex Pistols, so it was cool that, you know, I got to hear their music throughout it. And there's some cool kind of faux musical numbers in it, but... It was really the concept that really sparked my uh, interest and imagination to the point where I never finished it and actually never aired it. But when I was in college, me and a buddy had a, um, a cable access show. And we actually m filmed probably a, good, probably a good 45 minutes of, of a fake mockumentary about our cable access show that was done in the style of the, of the great rock and roll swindle. So I actually went as far to try to recreate this shit and rip it off and make my own version of it, Trev. That's how much I loved the, just the <laughs> bizarreness and the whatever format of the great rock and roll swindle. So <laughs> I'm assuming you don't have too many good things to say about this movie. <laughs> Uh, no, it's it's funny that I didn't think this was going to happen this early in the episode, Goat, but this this one almost made my, my three that I don't like list. Amazing. Uh, it, it ended up not making it, but but uh, I, I really don't like this. I, so I, I can't remember there have been talked about this show before. I know you know um, the Sex Pistols are a band that actually are pretty important to me. Uh, I hear an album of all time. It's never mind the Bullock series of Sex Pistols. Uh, I, I do love them. And uh, I hate... Malcolm McLaren with a passion. I mean, I understand. I you know I owe him for creating the Sex Pistols, but kind of he's also the thing that you know drove the wedding and destroyed them at the same time. And the fact that this movie is just like a a passion, uh, you know, vanity project for him to make himself the star. It's always rubbed me the wrong way. I think Johnny Rodden having anything to do with it sticks out like a sore thumb when you watch it. Uh, I've always been really disappointed that they didn't actually get to make Who Killed Bambi, which I, I assume you know about. Oh, that was yeah. their initial attempt to make a movie that was going to be like a version of like A Hard Day's Night or something, and that that fell apart and kind of turned into this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just it's it is a, it is a strange film. You're right. I mean, I guess if you're a huge punk rock or Sex Pistols fan, maybe you owe, your, owe it to yourself to see this just because it's such an oddity. But I don't think it's very good. Uh, but I will say, the director Julian Temple. To his credit, he came back 20 years later and made the great documentary, The Filth and the Fury, which is kind of the, the Sex Pistols document now. So I'm glad he came back and got it right uh, and gave the, the, the story rather than McLaren's. Yeah, I, I agree. I am no Malcolm McLaren fan, so I mean, I I definitely see the the shittiness in the project as well. But it just, it also, I don't know why, it's just an influential mm -hmm. movie to me. So moving along, Trev, why don't you give us your number four on your favorite? List? Yeah, I mean, man, I'm, I'm kind of jealous. Yours has already been a little more eclectic than mine because I feel like mine's a, a fairly obvious top five. But moving along in that direction, um, one of the all-time classic superhero films and one that I was just obsessed with as a kid and still kind of obsessed with today, Superman 2. Uh, I will say directed by Richard Lester, although we also know that it's kind of directed by, uh, you know, Richard Donner. So it's kind of a half and half deal there for those who don't know that full story. I don't know how much we want to get into it, but he kind of was filming one and two at the same time. Uh, but it was taking too long going over budget. So they kind of put a halt to part two and said, we'll come back to it. 
But in the meantime, the Salkinds, the producers, decided they didn't want him around anymore, fired Richard Donner and brought in Richard Lester to finish it up. And that's why the movie has kind of an odd an odd tonal mishmash to some degree, whereas you can see a lot of it that feels just like the first film. And then a lot of it is kind of more goofy comedy, which is the Lester, the Lester influence. But um, I don't know. I, as a kid, you certainly don't care about that kind of mishmash. Yeah. As long as something's fun and all the scenes work independently, that's that's kind of all you're interested in. I always thought this film did. I actually do still to this day prefer this to Superman. I don't know that it's a better movie necessarily, but it's it, as a kid, I loved it more. And I think Zod is just such a, a fantastic villain. Terrence Stamp is awesome. Um, and of course, I just, you know, Christopher Reeve will always be my Superman. I don't think. Uh, until Same I guess, yeah. I I guess to a certain degree Robert Downey Jr. with Iron Man, but uh, those two are the two I always think of as like talk about like a certain actor just completely embodying a character, and I just think like man, that's that's Superman, you know. And those two films, those first two, certainly show it off to just to a crazy degree, and just you know fun action. That action, I think, you know, yeah, it looks a little hokey today, but I think in terms of the scale of the action and the excitement of the fight scene in in New, well, Metropolis and everything, it's still holds up. I can still watch that and have a good time. And yeah, it's just a film that just always takes me back to the joy of being a little kid and playing Superman. And when you're playing it, you weren't necessarily playing like, I'm Superman battling evil real estate man, <laughs> Lex right, Luthor. Right. You're thinking about Superman versus General Zod and, and how cool that, that battle is. Just a very quotable film, Neil Before Zod. I think we've all said that multiple times in our life. And yeah, it's it's a good one. I also had an odd one as a kid. I had a very, uh, I had a, a strange crush on uh, the evil Ursa, played by Sarah Douglas. Me too, you know kind of, to be yeah. honest with you. Yeah. 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 Full disclosure, I, I almost pulled a bastard move and put this on my three whatever, three, three you know, not liked films mm-hmm. but it, but it, I, the more i thought it through i was like i can't do it i can't it was it would have been a stunt thing and the only thing is and it's not even this film's fault i don't think like i like this movie a hundred percent i don't even have much to criticize except for i felt like there's so many movies superhero movies i should say that copy the whole thing of the hero losing his powers out of nowhere and mm-hmm. i feel like that kind of got started in this film but at the same time, it never bothered me with this film in particular. It just I just hate when other movies copy it. So I I, I couldn't pull pull that asshole. But first of all, it, you know my conscience would not let me. I love to be controversial. You know this, but my conscience would not let me because I love every Christopher Reeve Superman movie. And I know parts three and four are not very good movies at all. But I can sit down and watch them pretty much. Mm-hmm. You know, because I he is Superman to me. Like. Even to the point, like, sometimes I see comic book drawings of Superman. I'm like, that doesn't look like Superman. Because in my head, I'm like, that don't look like Christopher Reeve. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I, and I actually, uh, I prefer the, the the initial theatrical cut to the, the later reworked Donner cut. I, I do like the Lester touches in this movie, actually. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the only thing it's, you know, now that I've been a little older and have come to grow to love the character of Superman even more, uh, that last scene where he bullies some guys in a diner is kind of a bummer because that's not <laughs> yeah. very Superman esque. But no, you know, other not. than that, other than that, uh, I love it. No, yeah, I'm, I'm with you too. I think I have, you know, like I remember when the Richard Donner cut came out. You know, it wasn't that long ago, maybe twelve, fifteen years ago, whenever it came out on home mm-hmm. video, it was like a huge, huge deal, and uh, I was excited about it, and I rented it and watched it. And I, I mean, I enjoy it because, I mean, it is cool that we get to see Richard Donner's cut, but I'm kind of yeah. with you. I kind of, you know, the movie that I know and love and felt, you know, watched over and over on cable as a kid is the theatrical version. So Yeah. 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 So, all right, moving number three. Okay, I don't know why I thought my list was going to get quote-unquote normal after four and five. But, I mean, this I guess this movie, depending on who you talk to, this is kind of a whack job movie, too. Especially the little bit of the subject matter twist or whatever. But, uh, number three, just a movie I am stylistically obsessed with. And it's interesting you brought up the tidbit about Hitchcock dying in, you know, at age 80, mm, 1980. I know you're, I know what you're going to say. Yeah. Number three, dressed to kill by Brian De Palma, yep. who's been labeled the biggest Hitchcock ripoff artist and all this, but I love his movies with this movie in particular. I enjoy the whole movie all the way beginning, middle end, 
But for me, uh, the first 20 minutes, the way it shot and edited it, I just said, you know, I bought the Blu-ray maybe a year ago, and I just, you know, like, there's so many times I've just thrown it in for the first 20 minutes, you know, and I just, like, I'm, to me, that's almost like a full movie onto itself in terms of giving me my fix of, you know, over-the-top cinematic, uh, you know, photography and just, the, you know, just the whole atmosphere. I, lo I love this movie, and I, I'm actually a big, I guess because he made so many movies in the 80s, I'm a big fan of Keith Gordon, I think. He did a pretty damn good job for playing, you know, I always thought it was interesting, the idea of a teenage character kind of investigating his own mother's death. And I'm a De Palma fan anyway. I guess, I guess I'm like a bastardized Hitchcock fan because I've only seen a handful of Hitchcock movies, but I've like, you know, pop a boner over, you know, like so many of the early De Palma movies. So, but yeah, I, lo I love Dress to Kill, uh, and obviously we owe it all to Hitchcock, but, but that doesn't bother me, and I don't think, in my mind at least, it doesn't diminish uh, Brian De Palma's talent. Like, I still I still see, you know, his own touches in there, and, you know, but I but I think this one is like, a you know, and obviously, this one actually, they're all kind of love letters to Hitchcock, but I think this one for me is the one that, you know, kind of strides the line the most, and... I don't know, you know, I don't want to get into spoilers just because as insane it is to say a movie from 1980, if there is anybody out there who's not seen Dress to Kill, maybe you just heard about it over the years and you've always, eh, maybe I'll watch that, maybe, like, rent it, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm sure it's available to stream at a lot of different places, but, like, actually watch it and get into it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's pretty much a masterpiece of a movie. And for an extra fun time, try to imagine that movie coming out today and the think pieces it would yes. uh, create. <laughs> and that's what I was going to say, and that's why I didn't want to Not the most away, politically you know. correct film today, but that's all no, right. Not politically correct at all. You know, just delving into, I guess, what would be considered per perverse psychology. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sure. At, at, at that time period, at least. But mm -hmm. now, obviously, that, like you said, the subject matter treated differently. But but either way, just as a horror fan, suspense fan, I think, you know, it, it really delivers the goods. And, I, you know, as far as, like, his suspense movies, I'm also a huge, huge fan of Blowout. But as far mm -hmm. as his suspense movies, I think maybe Dressed to Kill is his best. So, yeah. <laughs> Dress yeah, because I, I mean, I, I think so too. Because I, I like Blowout a lot too. But I also, with, the thing with Blowout is that you can't help but compare it to Blow Up. Right. Uh, and I think Blow Up might be just a little better. And so, and then, so, Dress to Kill feels, I, well, obviously, Dress to Kill is not a remake, whereas Blowout is. Right. Um, and so, Dress to Kill feels a little more original, even though, like you said, it's just kind of cribbing on Hitchcock. But uh, you know, it's a lot of fun, great performances. Uh, man, young Nancy Allen, whoo! Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> yeah. And then a uh, great score by Pino Donaggio too. I really love the the music in that. Uh, yeah, no, it's a good one. And there's a heck, you can go out and get it on Criterion. So we're not yeah. just whistling Dixie here. You know, other people certainly recognize it. So a movie so good. It's been I think it is. I think it's one of those choice. I think it's one of those films that when it came out, it was like really kind of reviled. And yeah, it was. It was yeah, and uh, I feel like it didn't take too long for it to kind of start getting a little reappreciated, though. It wasn't like it took like, you know, 40 years. I feel like it, it kind of got its time quicker than some others have to wait for. Yeah, because it was, I, I guess, and to be fair, there was a, lot, there was a glut of slasher films at the time. Mm -hmm. Some of them not so artfully done, obviously. And I felt like this film got swept up in kind of that wave of people complaining that cinema in general had become way too violent. So, like yeah. you said, yeah. So, yeah, Trev, let us know what you got number three on your list. So, number three um, is a film that uh, I kind of, this was one of the ones, like you said, where I was, like, surprised that it was this early. I kind of feel like in my head it was something that came along a couple years later. But, uh this is to me, man. Okay, for, so first of all, before I say it, I will say going over the list of 1980s films, what a great year for comedy! So many amazing comedies released in 1980. Uh, but at the end of the day, I was going to choose just one, and to me, this is arguably, arguably the greatest comedy ever made, and that's Airplane. Oh uh, yes, <laughs> directed by uh, David and Zer Jerry Zucker and Jim Abrams. Uh, you know, a three-man directing trio on this one. Uh, to, still, to me, just the the high point. Because when I say arguably, the only other movie I think gives it a run for its money is the greatest comedy is Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and that's a kind of a different kind of pa parody film. Um, but this is like Airplane is to me by far the high point of the film parody. 
you know, it's a parody of um, particular, you know, kind of film, disaster films. It's actually specifically a parody of a 1957 movie called Zero Hour. Uh, it takes kind of the, the main plot from that. But it's also certainly borrowing off of the, you know, like the airport movies had been coming out in the 70s and those was just airline disaster films. And this is just one of those, you know, joke every 10 second kind of all just weird gags and verbal humor, uh, non sequiturs, surrealism. It's really, man. It's just one of those ways that it it's got a crazy joke pace. It feels like it's making a joke every every second you're looking at it. But but man, they're almost all good. <laughs> like there's there's very very few stinkers. And I have this thing with comedies where I kind of don't want to watch the comedies I love a lot. Right. Because I think like comedy is one genre where if you like it, you kind of want to wait a long time and forget the jokes and go back. But Airplane's a movie I could watch every couple months and still find funny it's just it just works so well and i certainly watched the hell out of this as a kid and it and i still find it just as funny today um just you know man robert hayes leslie nielsen julie haggerty lloyd bridges robert stack they're all so good in it and even like what is a kid you're thinking like wait kareem abdul jabbar's at this I like know. yeah and just even the joke that pays off that um yeah i don't know i, I don't know what more you can say about airplane what more you need to say about it it's a classic and for a reason yeah i always loved it as a kid because like you said the jokes come so fast and furious i mm-hmm. you know as a kid i liked it because it's it's almost like when you watch it it's almost like you know i mean yeah it is you know a comedy and it's just trying to make you laugh but at the same time like because it's, you know, it's such at a feverish pace, and I had never seen that before, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, I loved it as a kid, because it almost felt like an alternate reality. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's just like a whole nother world, so yeah. And you know, the Zuckers back then, and Abrams, uh, you know, they they kind of all started, they all got to a point where they were making worse stuff as they went along. It took a while, though. I mean, I, I like, you know, the, the Hot Shots movies and Naked Gun, for sure. But uh, through all those, the consistency is they did this this genre right, you know, unlike this like crappy date movie, epic movie thing where you you just have a reference in place of a joke. These are actual jokes. Oh, you yeah. Know? Like it's not just a haha. That's the thing from the movie. So you're supposed to laugh. They This is actual like really well done joke construction. So just even like even like the runner about people trying to kill themselves as they listen to Ted Stryker, you know, tell his story and and the Lloyd Bridges, you know, giving up everything like drinking and sniffing glue. It's just everything pays off. And man, yeah, I like I said, to me, it it could be the greatest comedy ever made. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't I can't even argue with that because, I mean. No matter where you put it, if it's not one of the, if it's not the best, it's in the top three at least. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I should preface that at least for, you know, people of our generation or yeah. era. Like I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure Keystone Cops had some people wet in their <laughs> pants in the 1920s, yeah. but you know, for the modern era, I, I would definitely agree with you on that. So yeah, so wow, going down to number two already on my list. This is another one. I had heard about this film for many years. I know for a fact I actually saw at least part of it on cable as a kid because there's one scene in particular I remember, and it's it's not even like a real memorable scene. It's just a weird scene. But um, yeah, this is another movie. Um, it kind of didn't get its due at the time. Highly controversial uh, for different, you know, various reasons. But uh, you're watching now, like I just love it. I think it's so unique. It's so bizarre. Going with the suspense slasher, whatever. I'm a big fan of the film Cruising, starring Al Pacino, directed by William Freakin. Mm-hmm. It's very, it was very controversial. People don't know it's about um, a heterosexual cop, played by Al Pacino, uh, and I guess there's um, um, kind of like mounting political pressure because there's um, uh, gay men being killed, like within the gay bar scene. I guess you could say there's like a serial killer that kind of picks guys up in in uh, bars or whatever and takes them places, and, you know, and and murders them. And you know, it's it's kind of like the pressures mounting of like, hey, you don't you don't care about um you know the gay community, and then also at that time this this being a 1980 film, a lot of people still being prejudiced. So like it's like I know freaking took a lot of shit for this movie because it, it it does feature a lot of graphic kind of you know the sexual acts between men and stuff and where they're filming it and there's a lot of stuff that was actually happening on set that you don't see in the final movie and 
There was, you know, even protests from the gay community thought it was being highly exploitive. Like, in terms of that issue, I can't really speak to that. You know, like, I don't, you know, if this movie's offensive to people, you know, if they think it portrays gay people negative. Like, I, to me, it's just a serial killer movie, and I love serial killer movies. And um, without giving too much away, there's kind of a twist that happens about halfway through that I always thought kind of made this one of the more interesting films of this genre. And it's just... Pacino, I mean, I love Al Pacino. I think this is one of, actually one of his most underrated performances. I would probably, if I, I mean, without sitting down with every single movie in front of me, I would probably put this in Pacino's top five of performances that I, I just think it's interesting watching him wrestle with that. You know, ha, you know, having to blend into that world, learn about that world, and just you know, and then just kind of like a lot of weird. I will say almost temptation to the dark side in both terms of violence and sexuality that his character goes through. It's a very ambiguous piece. But another thing that, like, as far as just horror movies or suspense movies, the thing that always scared me about this is it's guys being killed in the movie. And, like, kind of as a guy, I don't know if you ever had this viewpoint or not, Trev, but it's, like, kind of like when you watch horror movies... You know, and it's just, it's always mostly girls being killed, or it's the, you know, the final girl. It's always a girl. Like, as a guy, like, there's not much of a threat to me of a giant killer who only kills 90 pound girls. But, like, when there's somebody actually going around, ki you know, killing grown men, like, I don't know, just to me psychologically, and I, and I, the violence in the kill scenes as well is, is disturbing as well. But I don't know, I just like this movie because I like how disturbing it feels. I think it plays great suspense. Pacino's awesome. So I actually really love Cruising. I'm actually very pissed it has not got a Blu-ray release yet because I think the cinematography and atmosphere would look great in high definition. Yeah, I've kind of wondered because this is a movie that I came to late. And uh, by the time I came to it, I was kind of coming in fully aware of the controversy around the film in terms of, you know, people thinking it's, you know, you said just full of stereotypes and kind of a, you know, a negative take on the, the gay community. And it's, I mean, I can watch the film and certainly see that. Although I think going in, knowing that that's a, a lot of people's thoughts about it, I think if you go in steeled for that, you might watch and be like, really, that's it. You know, it doesn't, yeah. I don't know. It, um, but I, I kind of wonder if that's what prevents it from getting that kind of re-release and Blu-ray. If no one wants to touch it at this point yeah. because of the, you know, the kind of just current climate we're in and how it might seem reductive. But, uh, yeah, I remember, you know, I wasn't I wasn't uh, blown away by it or anything, but I guess I, it certainly wasn't... I didn't find it as offensive as I think I was preparing for it to be, and I thought it was just a kind of a, a, a well-done thriller. Uh, you know, Friedkin knows what he's doing in that genre. Just in, like, the early 80s, it's kind of... I, I, I'm trying to think if there's, like, a third one I could add into this, but, like, a, a almost a genre of tough guy actors you don't want to see in like sexy thrillers about cops going into that world right. uh, there's this and then tightrope with clint eastwood which is another film that kind of trades in that territory but uh yeah i i, I can see i can look at this and see why you would like it so much yeah and just, I, it just it just you know that time again just being such an original and bizarre movie and again like the controversy I mean, I can't really speak to it because, you know, I've seen this movie years later, like you said, like you hear it's an offensive movie and then you watch it and you're kind of like, well, by today's standards, you know, so, so I mean, I can't really speak to what people were thinking in 1980 about it, but yeah, like, mm -hmm. like I think it's really cool. And like, it's kind of funny too, that like, you know, how you said like them sexy thrillers, like I never really thought about it. But Pacino later on, like, almost kind of made the straight version of it as well, uh, with that Sea of Love movie with Ellen oh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. kind of similar little bit circumstances, but, yeah, so, yeah. So I'm a big fan of cruising. And I know there's also a lot of cruising jokes out there in terms of, uh, there's actually, it's really cool. Like, you know those shitty, um, like, little Halloween costumes we had at kids where it was just like, um, like a plastic, uh, like, like tarp that you put on and it had the little mask with the string you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. those type of mm -hmm. halloween costumes. somebody actually did a photoshop and uh it, it, you can just google and search for it as a joke somebody made a cruising version of that and it's just but it looks legit like it looks like it's something physical it doesn't look like an illustration and it's it's kind of got like just a little jumpsuit thing with like policeman stuff on the front and it's got the little um 
little mask that you, I guess, would put on your face, and it's Al Pacino's face with, like, the little, I don't know, leather, leather bar guy hat on it. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's kind of interesting if anybody wants to look up that meme. But, yeah, so, so, Trev. Uh, how familiar are you with, uh, before I move on from cruising, yeah. just have you seen uh, Interior Leather Bar? Or? I have, I have. And uh, no, obviously the cruising connection with, and by the way, what, what Trev is talking about is, um, is James Franco. He made this short film, which is, I, I can't speak to, I don't know how real that was. Like, yeah, yeah. Like it kind of seemed like it was a put on to me, but it supposedly is about, it's a documentary, it's like an hour long documentary of supposedly James Franco. And I guess we should preface that there was a lot of stuff of cruising where there was, because cause, uh, Al Pacino goes into a lot of gay bars in the movie where it's like wall-to-wall people. And like, you think of a crowded bar, you think of people standing around drinking beer. But I'm talking about like crowds of people, hundreds of people. And uh, they shot it in like real places from what I understand. And they had like real, like legit guys. It wasn't like, you know, there's like a million, you know, and cruising. It's not like there's like a million you know, straight guys standing around trying to portray. Like, they really try to get the people from the scene and, and like you don't you can't really see it graphically in the movie but you can tell there's a lot of graphic sex acts going on in the back and supposedly there's kind of been these wild rumors that there's all this cut footage of cruising of you know from you know kind of in the background of the scenes all these these real life sex acts going on that while the film movie was being filmed and all this so james franco has this like fake doc well i can't say it's fake i don't know maybe it's real where he's trying to recreate the supposed lost footage of cruising and he gets one of his friends, who I thought this guy was actually a really good actor. He kind of reminded me a little bit of Oscar Isaac. But he gets him to play Pacino, and they're, like, recreating these things. But then it's also the dynamic of his his friend is straight, and he's in these scenes where not necessarily he's having sex with men, but there's there's men and, like, I don't know, just a lot of weird sexual stuff. And then there's, like, there's like a weird meta angle about James Franco's sexuality, like... It's on Netflix, and it features, like, full-on, like, graphic gay sex, and I watched it one time, and I gotta admit, I wasn't really that blown away by it, but just as an art, whatever, project by James Franco, like, you know, it, whatever, it was a it was a one-time watch. Have you seen mm-hmm. it, Trev? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah. It just comes off as, like I said, I mean, nothing, not knocking it or whatever, but it's just like an art not an art house, but like an I, art I, school I, I, project. I remember so. it as being one of the first things we were kind of like, oh, so this is what James Franco is going to do now. <laughs> you know, it's like it was, shit, it was yeah. It, yeah, it was definitely one of the first like pretentious James Franco indicators. Yeah. All right. So uh, my number two then is, uh, well, apologies to one of my all time favorite authors, but uh, I'm going to say The Shining. Oh. And I know that might upset Stephen King, who yeah. seems to be the the one uh, person in the world who hates this movie. <laughs> but uh, he's turning over in his bed right now. Yeah, uh, but and it, you know I get it. Um, so I you know I, I understand his 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 issues with it. I won't take that away from him. But uh, at the same time, I like many others respect what Kubrick did with this film. And uh, you know, there's a lot of horror films I love, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Night Living Dead and you know, thing. Uh, we're you know even earlier we're talking about like, the exploitation films like Cannibal Holocaust and things like that that feel so scary and and so intense because of how raw they feel, right? How like raw and rough. And The Shining is the exact opposite to where it's like this is what happens when a when a master craftsman makes a horror film and just is every shot is meticulously planned. This thing chugs along like a well oiled, well designed machine, and you just can't you can't dispute it. This is a movie that. Uh, it's just beautiful. Every shot is perfect. Uh, man, Jack Nicholson, I, I understand what King is saying. Yes, he seems insane from the very beginning, but who who doesn't want to watch insane Jack Nicholson for two hours? It's it's great. And he's just so over the top of this. It's, it's one of my favorite performances of his. And it's just full of imagery and, and moments that I'll never forget. Like, geez, man, as a kid and hell today, the old lady scene is still one of the scariest things to it's me. Great. It's great. Yeah, it's just terrifying, and and yeah, and I and I love that, you know, I love it. it's got like the second life now of people debating the meanings and all these crazy conspiracy theories, which I think are all stupid and ridiculous. But yeah. it's still it's it's still fun. Like I really like that documentary, the uh, you know, the about about that whole thing, and 
Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I, I love it. It's 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 my favorite Stephen King movie, actually, even though I know it's one that he's not particularly pleased with as far as an adaptation. But I, I think it's one of those great examples of a filmmaker taking someone else's story and putting their own spin on it and creating something that's different, but equally valid and just a, a beautiful piece of art. And you don't often get to say that about horror. And as a horror nerd, I like that you can point to something like this and be like, see, this is when hot horror can also be just so classy, but still scary. I agree. And, and it just, you know, th- th- this, I mean, this would have been on my top 10 for sure. It almost made it on my top five. Like I really had to wrestle with saying, okay, there's no way in hell the great rock and roll swindle and cannibal Holocaust is better than the shining. But then mm-hmm. I just went back to, again, how many times have I watched these movies? And sometimes these kind of weirder ones. And the sh- the Shining, like when I got my first really big big screen TV, my sixty inch TV, I made it a point to that the Shining was the first film that I watched on it. You know, all the way through full length, and it just. Mm-hmm. I tell you what, the some of the cinematography. I mean, it's I don't know how many times I've seen over there because this was another one I watched a million times on cable. Now, obviously, on cable, when you're a kid watching on a little tube TV, you're not getting the effect that you can get now watching the Blu-ray. But just yeah, like as many times have I seen this man, it never gets old visually. And I think you know, obviously, it's scary, it's frightening, it's well acted. But the best compliment I can give. Kubrick as a filmmaker in terms of the way he shot, directed, and edited this movie is when I watch it, I feel like I'm there. Mm-hmm. Like this place is enormous, it's huge, but you feel the claustrophobia, you feel like you're there, you feel like the madness that's like kind of taking over, you know, Jack Torrance, Jack Nicholson. You kind of feel it too, because it's just like you can't help but watch this movie for, you know, however long this movie is, two hours, whatever. You can't be in this place and like mentally not be there and not feel the claustrophobia and the fear, you know? Yeah. So yeah, big props to the shiny. All right. We're getting down to my number one and this is a movie. Finally, I can say, you know, whatever without shame, no precursors. I just love this movie. Uh, this is another one. I didn't, you know, see full length until I was older. I believe I was, uh, I don't know exactly. Early twenties, maybe twenty two or something. I saw it in a repertory movie theater, and uh, I was lucky enough to catch it. You know, not on the biggest screen, but on a big screen, and, and it just sucked me in. Uh, well, talking about Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. I mean, mm-hmm. I just love De Niro. I just love this movie in particular. Um, you know, Taxi Driver is my favorite film of all time, and sometimes when actors and directors have close relationships and they make movie after movie after movie sometimes it kind of sometimes as a fan maybe like you can, you kind of actually don't want that cuz sometimes it can you know kind of tarnish the whatever of like a previous work but raging bull totally does not in my mind at all tarnish you know what they accomplished in taxi driver if anything this was taking it up even another step of just like I don't know, this is another one. Just the cinematography, the acting, the everything, the you know the scenes of, um, you know De Niro and Joe Pesci as the brothers bickering back. It's just another movie. Like you almost feel like you're there in the room, and you know, as much of a kind of enigma as Jake LaMotta kind of is. And, like, you don't understand why he's so damn crazy and why he's willing to take the punishment. Like you kind of. You know, for for a movie about a a person, a, a real life person, who, by all accounts, probably wouldn't be very sympathetic at all. I think this movie make you, makes you feel a lot of you know empathy and sympathy for him, and it just I don't know, it just it's amazing. It's and it, and it's one of those probably I guess the right the first really big De Niro physical transformation of dropping weight, putting sixty pounds on just. Just crazy. I mean, just just a, a showcase of great directing, great acting, everything like that. So yeah, I I can never that Raging Bull is a movie that if anybody ever tells me that they haven't seen it, I just without question, no matter who they are, I'm like, no, you got to see Raging Bull. You just got to see it. 
I'm really glad it's on your list because this for me was like what you said about The Shining. It was one where I felt so bad leaving it off yeah. my top five. And I really had to wrestle back and forth without this and Elephant Man. I'm like, oh, man, which black and white true story from 1980 do I pick? You know, and I went with Elephant Man. But, yeah, I love Raging Bull, too. I think you're right that I think for a lot of people, I think even I'd do it, too. I I, I gets maybe lost the shuffle sometimes when you think about it because I default to Taxi Driver. Um as like, you know, I don't know why, I, maybe it's just because it came out so close together. So it's a lot of it like a, kind of a one two punch, no pun intended. But I think people tend to give all the attention to Taxi Driver and Raging Bull sometimes it gets a little uh, forgotten. But uh, also because it lost Best Picture, which is ridiculous because it's a <laughs> yeah. thousand times better than ordinary people. But right. whatever. Um, but yeah, such a great, such a great performance that, geez, every actor should clearly study. And, uh, and again, gorgeous black and white cinematography, and that's still some of the best, like you know, uh, choreographed fight scenes in, in oh, film yeah. history. The, yeah, the the fight where he fights Sugar Ray is like amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah, it's great. It's it, that's see now that's a film where I I wouldn't necessarily want to watch it every year because I think yeah. like it's nice to come back to it after a long amount of time of yeah, forgetting every five the film years actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, such such a good one. So let's hear your number one, Trev. Uh, all right. Well, geez, I hate to do it because we're going to wade back into this territory. <laughs> but we're going back to the wars because uh, uh, there's no film that I watched as much. Uh, that You know, I have anything that we've talked about today, this is the one I've seen the most in my life and will continue to watch at least once a year, I can guarantee, for the rest of my life. And that's The Empire Strikes Back, the uh, the second Star Wars film, or the fifth Star Wars film, if you want to be a... <laughs> nerd about it or whatever from <laughs> but, a certain uh, point of view <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> well, this is this really is a film because you know when when lucas made star wars look uh, you know we can he can sell this idea of this nine part saga that was uh, the original intention all he wants but i think we all know the truth is that he made that first one not knowing if he would do any more and certainly with no big plan and it was just kind of his his tribute to you know the serials he loved as a kid and then it blew up huge and suddenly he added uh, the the pressure on him to make more and then he came up with this idea of this this bigger saga and empire strikes back was the the film that cements that idea about this as a continuing a story and it really it even maybe more so than a new hope it it's it cements and forms what star wars is and what it can be and i'm definitely in that camp that thinks this is the best star wars film i i never put up too much of a fight when people say new hope i think that's yeah. those are both valid answers but to me i do prefer empire strikes back i just think it's more mature i think it's uh just a, a more layered complex film i think the characters are all a little better there's a little bit of an edge of darkness there um i think it's it's to, even today it's still brave and bold to end a film the way this one does you know i mean you knew you knew a third one was coming but I mean, for an audience at the time, especially an audience that's going to be mostly kids, right? To, to end your film with one of your heroes frozen in carbonite, another one having his hand cut off by the villain who was just revealed to be his dad. Spoiler alert! Uh, it's it was just uh, so so shocking. You get uh, Yoda shows up here. We get introduced to that incredible character, and and yeah, it's just great. And it, and it you know. It, and again, apologies, goat. <laughs> but no, I, I think it's also the, one of the, the films that shows that Lucas works best when he's more collaborative. Oh, when yeah. it's yeah. when when he's got, you know, Kasdan and Irwin Kirshner, Irvin Kirshner there to kind of put their own spin on it, too. It, it really works a little better than when he's just got the reins himself. So, yeah, Empire Strikes Back. I watch it at least once a year. I will for the rest of my life. And uh I mean, I watch all of them once a year, I, even the ones I don't like. But this one is one I always get excited about watching. Yeah, I, I feel like it's never a bad time to watch a Star Wars movie. Like, yeah. you know, sometimes you're in the mood, sometimes you're not. But, I mean, if you really want to, you know, get swept up in something and get taken away. I'm just I'm just curious. I want to throw this out there. I'm just curious if you agree or disagree with me. I think the duel between Luke and Vader in this one I think is the best lightsaber fight in all of the movies. Oh yeah. I mean, I agree. And it's because, you know, I've seen people have made this point before. You can choreograph those lightsaber fights to, you know, whatever crazy impressive degree you want, but if the emotion's not there, it doesn't matter how pretty the fight is. Right. And uh, not to say the lightsaber duel in this one's not pretty, because actually that part's amazing. It looks like they're fighting in an Argento film or something. It does. It's but, uh, great. 
but uh but the emotion is there too and just the, and the and what it builds to is just so incredible uh that that catharsis of getting that answer and just you know Luke's reaction and everything and yeah it's uh it, that's one yeah for sure the best like third act in in the whole series so yeah like i wrestle with this too as much as as much as i love star wars how could i you know any year where there's a star wars movie release how could i not have a star wars movie in my top five but i don't know this this list was much harder especially narrow it down to five it was much harder you know Mm -hmm. but it was a fun exercise you know and i definitely would like to do this you know you know some other time for other years is too and hopefully the the listeners like hearing it or whatever so yeah that's our my my favorite five and trev's favorite five in 1980 um mm-hmm. I, I i'm sure some people probably agree especially with my list some people probably think i'm smoking crack but or or they might think i've only seen five movies for 1980 <laughs> but either way i thought this was fun i'm not going to spend as much time on the negative ones now we're going to do the three ones we didn't like um, you know, not gonna sit here and rip movies, you know, especially for mine. My reasons were kind of arb, you know, kind of gut reaction, arbitrary. Number three, okay, I'm gonna take some shit for this, so I'm I'm sorry to offend fans of this film because I know there are legions of them in the horror community. But let me preface it: this is not a terrible, terrible movie. I could sit down and watch this movie anytime. If somebody was like, "Hey, let's <laughs> let's drink some beer and watch this movie," I can do it. But this movie in particular, I saw it many times on cable as a kid, did not think much about it other than it was just a horror movie to watch. Years later, the cult reputation grew bigger and bigger. You know, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I sat down to watch it again, reevaluate it, still see there's t-shirts of this movie. Trev, I am sorry, man. I'm not sure. Maybe this will offend you, maybe not. But I cannot understand what, what the big hype is about Motel Hell. (laughs) <laughs> uh no i mean i'm not like i i like motel hell but I, it's not like i'm gonna get so offended that you're yeah, saying that it's i de- do think like i don't know it's, it's decent for it's, what it is right it's a fun movie but it's there's better like cult kind of things out there i mean i could even point to something like fun house is something which i think is like a oh, yeah. better version of what that is yeah yeah, yeah way better yeah and and, and, and i do want to preface as far as the five best for the year I really thought, and then I had to weigh carefully. It was really close. The original Friday the 13th, 1980. I really wanted to put on, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, I don't like the original because it don't have Jason. I love the original. We did a commentary for it. I really like the original Friday the 13th. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I, you know, I think I said in the commentary, it's not one of my favorites, and I think I think that's a little overrated, but. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, it's uh, just because to me the series does kind of fully come into what it is more in part two. You're right. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I I enjoy Motel Hell, but you're not you're not making me mad with this. Like, I just you know, of all the movies, and, and you know, for many years, you know, um, and you know, I was a Fangoria reader for many years. I literally have a couple hundred issues of Fangoria, probably stacked away in comic book boxes. Motel Hell, it's it was always around. It was always a, I guess you could say a cult favorite. But man, people just love it now. They just love it. You know it. what I? You know what I think it might be, and I don't know if you'll agree with this because it kind of just occurred to me. I think for people like around our age of a certain generation, Motel Hell was one of the first like of a particular kind of horror comedy. Yeah. So if you like the idea of like a really goofy horror, like right. yeah, horror comedy had always been around, but Motel Hell in particular, it feels like that's the start of a, of a particular era of that where this kind of gory. Uh, you know, but mostly slapstick comedy kind of take on horror. And so I think people maybe just remember it fondly because as a kid, all these other slashers were so mean spirited and just dark at the time. And then Motel Hell is just so damn goofy. Yeah. And and like, that's the thing is like when I was a kid, it was kind of always that thing of like, Oh, I get it. Like, like they probably didn't have the money or they didn't have a good enough concept to make a, a quote unquote real horror movie. So they just made it goofy on purpose. Like that's honestly what I thought of as kid. Now, I mean, obviously now I'm older. I understand 
you know, they wanted to make that type of movie. You know, that's what they're into. But yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, don't hate me, everybody. But Motel Hell, it's always been a head scratcher. Trev, what's your number three on your list of like n- not not so hot of nineteen eighty movies? <laughs> Yeah, and again, like like you said, like I don't know, these are at least my two and three are more films that I'm just kind of surprised I don't like. Like they seem like something I want to like so much, and, and really find them very underwhelming. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my number three is The Big Brawl, mm-hmm. starring Jackie Chan, which yeah. uh, so was one of like, kind of his first big attempt to make it as an American action star. You know, he had small roles in the, the Cannibal Run film stuff, but this is his supposed this is supposed to be his big coming out here. And everything seemed in place. It's directed by Robert Klaus, who directed The Great Enter the Dragon. Uh, it's kind of, you know, has this cool setting of him taking on, like, the mob in uh, 1930s Chicago. Um, but, man, it ain't good. And I'll tell you the problem, I think, is that even though Robert Klaus has directed decent action scenes before, I think there's a lot of talk, and Chan has said so since, about not really letting Chan do his thing and yeah. kind of putting their stamp on it and... and having him conform to a particular kind of action style and action direction that doesn't work for him. And it's just, you go into it and you're thinking, well, okay, my, I've heard this isn't that good, but I'm sure I'll get some good fights into something. No, it's just the whole movie is so flat. And, uh, I mean, I guess the only nice thing I could say about it is it's, it's better than the protector, which was his like second attempt a few years later. Um, but even still, I, I, I'm, it doesn't surprise me that both of the both of those didn't work, and that it took him a longer time to finally get over here. With uh, oddly enough, it took just people finally putting his actual Chinese films out over here because *Rumble in the Bronx* was just an import. But uh, but yeah, uh, the big brawl, uh, sometimes seen as *Battle Creek Brawl*, if you get lucky enough to get some other copies of it. But uh, yeah, not that good. Yeah, and I remember this one from being on cable and shit a little bit, um, more like basic cable, and and I remember running across this over the years and be like, oh, there's a Jackie Chan movie, and then you watch it, and it's just, you're waiting for it to kind of kick in mm-hmm. and kind of do what a Jackie Chan movie does, And but it, it's interesting, though, when you look at, because like you said, like, later on, Rumble in the Bronx is what really kind of broke him big in America, and that was yeah. like, what, 12 to 13 years later? I, actually, yeah. maybe more. I think Rumble Brox maybe was released like around ninety five ish or something. something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it's interesting that they tried hard, or you know, so much earlier to break him in America and it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Okay, number two, we're gonna speed this up because I don't, I don't have much to say about this movie other than, for some reason, I always these movies were big at the time. They were always on cable. The original, the sequels. I can't. Even, I think there's a part three of this too, but. In 1980, they released the second part of Oh God, Book Two. This is, <laughs> I don't want to sound like a jerk picking on this movie, but I, even as a kid, I just thought this was a corny concept. And this is going to, okay, this is going to sound strange, but as a kid, I would like watch these. I like George Burns because he was this little old kind of hollower man. And for some reason, to me as a kid, his face, he reminded me of a chimpanzee. I don't know why. He always reminded me of like, you know, and, and I, I love animals, but I love, apes and chimpanzee and he was this like human guy who reminded me of a chimpanzee but yeah these you watch these oh god movies and it's just i don't know it's just i mean i don't know any other way to put it but it's just humor for like 70 year old people really yeah isn't there a part in one of them where he is a chimpanzee for a bit or something i feel like i remember there is a chimpanzee somewhere and i know because i i know i saw part one and two over and over on cable and it was one of those things like when you're a kid you just watch something because you recognize it but you don't really Mm -hmm. like it and eventually, I yeah, just like whenever I kind of, you know, that's why when I was looking at the list for 1980 movies, I was like, oh man, oh god, what a what a what a horrible. And obviously, they did well enough that they kept pumping them out. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. All right. Well, here comes my controversial pick. So I feel like when we do this, I always feel like you're you were saying how people are going to be mad at you, and I'm always like, I think I'm coasting by. No one's going to be mad at me. But I'm going to get some hate on this one because this is another one where I just like you and Motel Hell. I just don't get I don't get the cult following here. And I feel like I should. But I'm sorry, people. But Flash Gordon ain't that good. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I love oh, yeah. I love big, dumb space sci fi epics as much as the next person. Um, I do love this, the soundtrack. I mean, you can't go wrong with the, that Queen soundtrack. The, but the, I don't, the Queen theme song is awesome. Oh, it's awesome, yeah. And then when it kicks in, you can't help but be excited. But yeah. everything else, but it's, I mean, and Timothy Dalton's pretty fun, too. Um, but 
I don't, maybe it's just how bad Sam Jones is uh, as, as Flash Gordon. Yeah, he's really bland, and just the movie, it, I, I feel like it moves at a snail's pace. It's not even that long of a movie, I don't think, but man, it feels like it when you watch it. And it's just, it's not exciting, and I, I don't know, I, I just, it's it's not that it's even horrible, but so many people are obsessed with the neck, like it's this, like, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, underappreciated masterpiece, and it's it's yeah. not. It's, it's I think it's exact. I think it's, uh, the initial reaction to it is exactly what it deserved. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I'm actually, you know, old enough to remember when this was on cable when I was five or six years old, and like, no kidding, like, this is like what we watched when the you know the, there wasn't a way to watch star wars like that's yeah. really where it was like kids did not like this movie at all and even as a kid which i was like you know as a kid i hardly ever knew anything about the reputation of any movie I, yeah like we all knew something went wrong with flash gordon like it was it was just no now the flip side of that like like later on like when tron came out and like tron was a horrible flop money wise mm-hmm. It didn't matter because when Tron was on TV, we loved it and we wanted to watch Tron. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But, but but when Flash Gordon was on, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, there's not. I guess we'll watch Flash Gordon. You know what I mean? Like, it was really <laughs> yeah. like that, even as a, a young kid, you know? Yep. Like, that probably was, you know, honestly, just looking back and thinking of the time period, that probably was the first movie that, like, I equated, before I even really knew what it was, I equated of, like, a bomb movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And and I think too, it, it, it's got to be that movie Ted that has everybody jerking off to it now too, partially, right? Yeah, I guess I think that definitely brought the attention back to it. You know, yeah. they even put out like a Ted Flash Gordon like double pack Blu Ray. I saw yeah. it. Now, I do I do own a copy of Flash Gordon, <laughs> <laughs> so but I have not watched it in a very long time. So, but. So I'm going to go, again, real quick, number one, I just, another, a, a series of movies, I know they made at least two of these, this was also the part two, released in 1980, I'm sorry, I love this guy, great actor, talent, legend in the business, but I could, even as a kid, like, I cannot stand any which way you can, like, yeah, yeah I, it, it, I thought about, I thought about having that one too, I, I mean, I don't even, like, it's, the first one's okay. Yeah, the first, the first, okay, the first one's not terrible, but the, the, when they make the second, and by the way, they made the second one, I believe, when I was looking at, I think this one came out, like, two years after the other one, so, I mean, they, like, fast-tracked this shit, mm-hmm. just for an excuse to have Clint Eastwood screw around with Clyde the Ape, who, I guess, was, I think he was actually a orangutan, mm-hmm. and, you know, and it, it's just, it's just, like, you know, even as a kid, like, as a kid, it kind of appealed to me. But then when I watched it, it was like, oh, this is a, it, it's a monkey movie. It's going to be fun. But then you watch it, and it's really not. And I think part two, and I, and I don't mean to pick on this lady, because I actually like some of her stuff she did separately. But part two, I believe, is, is the one that kind of introduces Sa- uh, Sandra Locke. And I don't, yeah. have, I don't have a problem with Sandra Locke as an actress, but it got annoying how she was always in all the Clint Eastwood shit for a long time because of their, you know, their personal relationship or whatever. But, yeah, I got to admit, just looking back, you know, like Motel Hell, like I said, hey, whatever. And there wasn't, but in the, in this this little list was kind of hard to make too because there wasn't too much shit in 1980 that I legit hated, hated. Motel Hell was kind of like, I don't get the hype, but oh God, book two in any which way you can. I mean, I, I'll just be honest, I'll probably never watch either of these films. Even if I live to be 120, I'll probably never watch either one of these again. Yeah. Plus, I'm pretty sure if I remember, I think they like beat one of like the orangutans to death on like the set of this movie too. Really? So, you know, there's no... Yeah, yeah fuck this. Uh, <laughs> fuck any which way you... Hey, Clint Eastwood, how could you let this happen? Yeah. Do, do you think seeing Clyde the Ape stunt double get beaten to death, that's what encouraged him later to make a million dollar baby you think that was, a, <laughs> <laughs> that was loosely inspired by Clyde Dapes I would, I would I would love that to be true and if not we should at least put it under IMDb trivia anyways <laughs> exactly all right Chess. so what you got for your number one movie yeah yeah there's another one I don't I don't think it's gonna be that controversial because I think it's kind of often looked at as a a, a misfire and that's a uh, Popeye uh, oh. the, the Robert Altman Popeye movie which again that's another one where even as a kid I kind of knew something was wrong with this movie which is weird because like as a kid you accept a lot of bullshit but uh i don't know i it's weird i think the only way to describe this film is embarrassing <laughs> i watch yeah, it and i just feel yeah. kind of 
embarrassed for everyone involved. Like, it, every, I mean, I get what they're going for. And, it, you know, I don't have I'm not opposed to the idea of a live action cartoon. But, man, just it's it's kind of hard to watch because <laughs> you really feel like everyone's kind of debasing themselves somewhat in, yeah. in just the, the tone of the performances and just the visual look of it. And the fact that it's Robert Altman is just so bizarre. Weird, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's 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 not a fun watch. I mean, Robin Williams definitely was better suited in a lot of other material than this. I mean, he does a good Popeye, you know. I I, I, yeah. I get it, but it's I don't know. It's I don't think it's fun for kids, and I think as an adult, it's just uncomfortable. I'm with you. And full disclosure, you know, I had because I was a I, I actually was a legit fan of Popeye the cartoon. So when this movie came out. I had I had it for years. I had some kind of sticker book, and you bought these stickers. I don't think they were just trading cards. I think they were, like, <laughs> legit stickers. So I had, for years, you know, until I got older, I had Popeye stickers stuck on my dresser. I had all kinds of Popeye shit from this movie. And then I remember going to see the movie and not hating it as a kid because, like, I mean, I was, like, a baby when I saw this. But, I, but like you said, and, and then, like, it just it wasn't what you wanted as a kid, I guess that's the best mm-hmm. way to say it. And then going back to it, you know, and then realizing, hey, Robert Altman made that movie. Because for years and years to me, it was just a weird kids movie, you know. And I was like, Robert Altman, Robin Williams is pop. I I was like, this is going to be some cinematic genius shit. And like, there was a stretch a couple years ago, it was like on cable a lot. And I, I tried to watch it and get into it a couple of times. And yeah, it just, it's, it doesn't hook you in, man, the way you think it would. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So that's that. That's the least liked of 1980, and, and and you know I knew that would be a little bit of a downer. So let's um, let's go ahead and uh, go out. Uh, I'll just do my two back to back just to speed things up. Uh, for these are movies that we haven't seen from 1980, but we want to, and they're always on his list to see, and we just never get to it. Number two, I don't know if you ever seen this, Trev. It's called The Final Countdown, and uh, it's a weird time travel movie about a modern day aircraft carrier that I guess travels back in time to the day before Pearl Harbor. It's got a Roy Scheider in it, right? Yeah, and I could I could be wrong, but I think like Kurt Douglas and Martin yeah. Sheen are in it too. I, I have I, I have seen that. It's another one where I saw it like on TV, like you know, yeah. like my local one of my local channels, like you know, noon on like a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah, I just I've never seen a clip from this movie. I've never seen part of it. I, I think maybe I watched the trailer on YouTube one time, but I just always wanted to see this movie because how bizarre the plot, you know, is right. And my my number one pick, I'm kind of a dick. This is a dick move, me picking this. This is a movie I've owned the Blu-ray of, like, for, like, two years, and I just haven't watched it yet. But I've always wanted to see this movie, and it was, it was kind of a movie. Actually, I have seen this movie, but it was, like, so long ago on cable, I don't remember it, because I remember this being on. But I'm talking about Used Cars, starring Kurt Russell, directed by Robert Zemeckis. <gasps> oh, my God. I can't believe I've never seen Used Cars. I, I, I know I've seen it because when I looked at the pictures and clips of fucking how cheesy Kurt Russell is, I know I've seen this movie, but it was a million years ago. I got the Blu-ray on my shelf. I actually almost picked it out to watch last night, but I was like, nah, it's on my list. I'll wait. So, so <laughs> yeah. I probably will get off my ass and actually get this. I even requested this as a gift like two years ago for somebody. They're like, you know, what you what? do you want for christmas where i was like can you get me you know order me used cars 30 dollar twilight time blu-ray and i still have not watched it and just one of those ones it's always in the t- like it's literally in the to watch pile it's not even like on the shelf with other movies it's in the to watch pile and somehow it always gets pushed out but mm-hmm. yeah I'll, I'll be watching that soon all right cool all right uh so my two is the first one is uh actually this is what this is on shutter right now so i will be able to finally get to it when i have the time and it's been something i just keep putting off but that's the ninth configuration uh which is um written and directed by william peter blatty and actually kind of takes place in the same universe as the exorcist in terms of the novel because like the one of the characters in this is a character that also pops up at the party at the reagan house in the exorcist but this is this is not a devil possession story this is about um a castle where a bunch of military people are being kept in some kind of strange uh i guess it's like an insane asylum for the military and they're being held and, and there's some kind of experiment going on with them i don't know i haven't seen it so i'm only vaguely familiar with what it's about 
but uh, it stars Stacey Keach and Scott Wilson, both of whom I really like. Oh, and Jason Miller from The Exorcist is in there. And I mean, the main reason I really want to see it is because I was, I've, I'm was i really impressed with what William Peter Blatty did as a director with Exorcist 3. I thought as someone who was just a novelist who decided to direct his own films, I thought he made such an amazing horror film with that. that I'm, I'm curious to see what he did with The Ninth Configuration. So uh, I don't know. Have you seen that one, Goat, or...? Yes and no, and this actually almost went on my list, and this this is what's fucked up. The reason I want to see that movie is I know I was taken to see it, because I actually remember my dad talking about it afterwards, and like, mm-hmm. and like you know, I guess maybe not not in a negative way, but just, just he thought it was going to be something different than what it was, and I remember that title. I always remember that title. It was burning in my brain, and this was like back when movies played for a while, so I don't think it would have been first run. I think it probably would have been... Like a year later, probably around the time I was probably four or something. But I know for a fact I was taking it, and I was taking the crazy shit, dude, when I was young. I was taking to see Warren Beatty. I remember the most boring time I've ever had in the movies. I was about five years old, and I went to see Warren Beatty's Reds, and it was like <laughs> torturous. So I give myself some credit for having the, uh, I guess, attention span to be able to watch adult movies when I was a kid. But yeah, I actually really, and this this almost went on my list, but I was like, well, I've kind of seen it, but I don't really remember it. Obviously, I don't remember anything about it. But yeah, that's kind of weird you brought that up because that's, that's kind of like a weird, because just the, the title always stood out in my mind. And that's when I kind of, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. and I don't want to say anything, but I, I actually do remember some plot elements from this because I remember my dad talking about it after we watched it or went to see yeah. it. So, yeah. So, yeah. Interesting pick. And, yeah, like, I agree. We both, that's a movie we both should see. Yeah. All right. Then my, my number two or my number one, whatever. And, and again, this is one I'm not sure if you've seen, Goat, but it's one that just the just the idea of it sounds interesting to me. And it's another one I'm, I can't believe I haven't seen. But I think it was even kind of under the radar at the time and maybe it's been more rediscovered recently. But that's the stunt man starring Peter O'Toole and Steve Railsback yeah. uh, and, and Barbara Hershey. Um, so this is a film about uh, of, like someone on the run from the cops and he kind of stumbles onto a movie set. And from what I understand, like the, the director, you know, tells him, like, well, I'll hide you from the cops as long as you agree to be a stuntman in this film I'm making, which is a big war movie. And he keeps making him do more and more dangerous stunts. And, uh, you know, this is actually a pretty well received movie that came out. Piero O'Toole is nominated for Best Actor at the Academy Awards. The director was nominated. But uh, it's certainly not one of those ones you think of when you think of Peter O'Toole in, in general. But uh, I don't know. It sound, I've I've read some really good things about it. That that plot just sounds cool, even by like today's standards. That sounds like a really interesting you know uh, story. It does. And uh, and I'm always down for a, a good Peter O'Toole movie I haven't seen. So it's one I'll try to get on soon. Yeah, I haven't seen it either, and I'm very aware from it, mostly because the poster is insanely burned into my brain. I guess it was a famous poster, but. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but 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 no, yeah, that actually is one that you know, and that almost went on my list as well when I was looking on Wikipedia. But yeah, I, I think that's definitely. I think both of yours are are picks that I need to see too. So, yeah. yeah. So this actually went way longer. This went about an hour and a half. I thought this was going to be like a forty-five minute episode. So, but mm-hmm. it was actually nice to be able to kind of roll through our memories, you know, mm-hmm. refresh yeah. our nostalgia on this shit. So I mean, this should be the time when when we plug uh, Trev's uh, Days of Future podcast, examining X Men. But uh, I, I want to. I'm not going to end this on a on a. Well, actually, I think this will be an okay note. But I, I want to drag us down into the muck, Trev. I hate to do this to you, but we need some downloads for this podcast, and nothing generates more interest in the world of online media, whatever, than Star Wars and specifically the Last Jedi. And I have a question for you about The Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I know you're a fan of it. I'm assuming you've seen it multiple times. And I legit, after I got the uh, Blu-ray, watched this. So let me just refresh people's memories. Because I'm drawing a blank on this. And I want to know what you think. All right, let's, let's go back to whatever, a year and something ago. And I've been actually meaning to ask you this for about two months. (laughs) So, okay, the first... Te- actually not even the first teaser poster the first the logo of the film when the title was revealed the last jedi everybody went crazy because it was in the color red which i don't believe i think if i'm not mistaken i think the only ones that have been in red i believe were return of the jedi and revenge of the sith am i right about that trev 
Yeah, maybe. You know, you're you're probably getting into stuff that's like so nerdy that I am only vaguely interested. But, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. So the color red. I remember fans, whatever a year ago, were into this. The first teaser poster comes out. It's it's a yeah. mo- mostly. No, I, red, I remember that too when people were freaking out about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly red image of uh, Ray kind of holding the lightsaber up, reminiscent of kind of the original posters with, I believe maybe Luke's face, but it was all red. Then like the legit you know um one sheet uh comes out like if you remember the force awakens one sheet was very colorful landscape reminiscent of like the original new hope one sheet but this one the last jedi one sheet it was all red with white everybody was wearing red clothing for some reason Mm -hmm. which is weird because because i don't actually don't think any of these people wore red clothing in the movie Mm -hmm. then you get to the actual movie itself one of the most famous, uh, you know, scenes of The Last Jedi is Snoke's throne room, all red. His guards, all, like, literally all red. Even their weapons are red. Then we get to this planet called Crate, which looks like it's snow, but when you scrape it, it's actually salt. Underneath is, like, a red mineral. Actually, there's an action scene where Chewbacca flies a Millennium Falcon into the planet. Uh, and the inside crystals of this, like, mining planet or whatever it is, it's, it's all red. Now, the director, Ryan Johnson, he's very meticulous with uh, his cinematography and his choices, like especially if you go back to his first film, Brick. Maybe not so much with the colors on Looper, but Looper definitely was very meticulous with the way shots were composed and stuff. So, I mean, I don't think this guy is um, doing shit, you know, just on the cuff or whatever. And obviously I don't think the director picks all the, you know, the marketing materials for the movie, but I just knowing a little bit about, you know, comments he said, I think he had a hand in it. So what I'm asking you, Trev, as a guy who is a fan of the last Jedi, what do you think is the significance of the color red with this movie being so strongly tied? Because we've never seen anything like this with any other star Wars movie. I don't think. Yeah, the only thing I could think is it it's just what you said. It's that it's different for Star Wars. And I mean that I mean I know it sounds like I'm being an idiot now cuz I'm going into that subverge uh you know subverting expectations <laughs> yeah. thing that everyone loves to poke fun at and I even think it's kind of silly, but uh I I don't know. To me with those like the, I know the posters you're talking about where they're all wearing red and Yeah. I don't know that I even ever it's thought. Weird. I don't think yeah. I don't think I saw those posters and expected that to actually be in the movie. I just no. t- took it as like it was this kind of like cool visual look, and that's kind of what I took with everything. But I think like the, the thing with the red, and I don't know, like to me, like when I think of red, you associate it with the dark side for some right. reason. Like it kind of feels like connected to like Vader and everything. And and I really felt like having the promotional materials be red and the title in red. We're really trying to sell this idea that this would be like, you know, the dark middle part of the trilogy, just as Empire Strikes Back was. And I think that's what they were trying to sell. Um, so that's that's my guess, best guess as to why all the promotional stuff was kind of heavy on the red. I mean, the the red stuff on Crate, I think that's just because it looks cool. And I think Ooh. sometimes that's OK. You know, I think it can just be like, yeah, this is neat, you know. Um, and something we hadn't really seen before. And like I said, like uh, that kind of swash of red hadn't really been a color scheme we'd seen before. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's. I, I don't want to say that's like a boring question to me, but I think like your your question to it is connected to what it is about Star Wars that makes it a hard <laughs> franchise for people to talk about yeah. and, and turns into these controversies. Is everyone feels like everything has to be analyzed, and sometimes it might just be that the director is like, "This looks cool." You're right, yeah. and and I totally, I don't know. Like I've just I've I've tried to go go down different paths to try to figure it out. Like the the actual planet is once you scrape it, there's red underneath. The core mm-hmm. of it is red. I'm like, well, to me, in the kind of Shakespearean way, it, it resembles blood. Yeah, uh, the blood. Uh, that ties Kylo Ren to Princess Leia and also Luke and, you know, and what happened with Han. I mean, I've tried to go down the whole thing of what red symbolizes, but then I can't really tie it into why Snoke's room is red. Like, it's just, I don't know, you know, and and, and not saying that Ryan Johnson is somebody, as far as I know, and that's what I was wondering if maybe you read something I didn't. I haven't even heard him allude to anything with the color red. But, you know, with all this Stanley Kubrick Room 237 type shit out there, I was like, 
it has to hold some kind of significance that I'm not seeing. Because I generally, uh, I want to figure this out. But I also know, just like you said, literally, it just could be a, a color choice. Because, oh, it looks, or, you know, or Star Wars never had a red planet before. Let's make a red planet. You know what I mean? Like, it mm-hmm. could be anything. But, it, but at the same time, there's just enough little clues. Okay, maybe the planet and then Snoke's, like, room being red. Maybe that's just a coincidence. But I just felt like, they're, like, they with the marketing they're like look at the color red look at the like i felt like they were wanting you to delve deeper and try to figure something out so yeah i don't know i can't figure it out so just another star wars mystery i guess <laughs> call jj abrams yeah so i got one more question for you not star wars related okay um okay you maybe you're aware of these trailers for this movie maybe you're not um because uh, it hasn't been too, but there is basically a movie coming out this Friday that looks like an X Men ripoff. Since you're an X Men expert, that's why I'm asking you this. Are you aware of this movie, Trev? What What's the title? I might be. Give me the title. I think it's something I did see a trailer for. <sighs> yeah, I I'm blanking on the title. I I I knew of this movie from trailers. I didn't um, remember the name. It's got a real like weird name. In terms of what it is, let me, let me, I'm sorry, I apologize. I looked at this yesterday, or not yesterday, today. Okay, it's called The Darkest Minds. And it's about yeah. children who have X Men type powers rounded up, and then they have to escape, kind of like the mutants and X Men. And I just want your, you know, you, you know, being a, a co host of an X Men podcast. This movie looks so much like X Men. And if I'm not mistaken, let me double check. Yes, if I'm not mistaken, this movie, which looks like a complete X-Men ripoff, is being released by Fox this Friday. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, there are two X-Men movies that, as far as I know, are either <laughs> completed or almost completed in complete limbo, uh-huh. may never see the light of a theater now because of the mm-hmm. Disney acquisition. So what's your hot take on they'll release the <laughs> fake X-Men, but not the real X-Men movies that they made? All right. Uh, yeah. Okay, so first of all, I did see the trailer for this, and I remember what was so funny about this is that I, this, the, I can't remember what film it was that I saw. Oh, it was when I saw Upgrade, I think. I yeah. saw the trailer for this, yeah. Darkest Minds, and then something else. I don't know the name of the movie, but it's like another movie about young – it's like another young kid sci-fi movie about a kid who finds this like alien gun, and him and his brother like use the gun to do different things, and then the government comes after them. Mm. And what's funny is both of those trailers, which I saw in a row – like they weren't even separated by their <laughs> trailers. There was one and then the other – they both said from the producers of Stranger Things and Arrival, oh, and I was God. like, "Wait, why are like why is that in both of these trailers? And why am I getting all these Stranger Things Arrival producer movies shown to me?" Um, the Darkest Minds, though, what I what I do know about it is that it's actually based on a popular YA series right now, mm. so it's not like an original property. It, right. it is like another adaptation. So it's you know studios are still scrambling to, uh, oh maybe one of these series out there is the is the next Hunger Games or something, you know, and they keep like they keep trying with like Maze Runner and Insurgent and all these things, and nothing quite is getting to that Twilight Hunger Games level, and Darkest Minds certainly is not going to be it. And I think what happens is I think they buy up a lot of these YA series early on, and then they're obligated to make that, at least that first movie. And then with something like right. Darkest Minds, they're probably like, well, we made it. Might as well release it. Yeah. But there's, but it's, it's probably lower stakes for them than X-Men, right? Like it doesn't right. – they'll just throw it out and see what kind of small profit they can – they can get, but it's it's not maybe the embarrassment that uh, that the X Men, you know, if that New Mutants film flops and it looks really bad right. for them, or um, and there's probably no planning either because I think with these other X Men movies, like you guys, when you talked about when Deadpool two came out, like it actually takes time, I think, to set up all those merchandise tie-ins and promotional partners, and I think that side of it is more lucrative than we think for the studio. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah, it is. It's a bummer that you're getting like you said something that just looks like X Men, but you're not getting X Men. But uh, I don't know. Darkest Things is just gonna come and dissipate like a fart in a windy room, yeah, so it doesn't. It doesn't really matter, I suppose. I mean, yeah, because I, I think actually I saw this trailer with Upgrade as well. Now that you mm-hmm. mentioned that, and I was kind of. I mean, I didn't think anything of it. I'm just like, oh, you know, more. If anything, it looked more like that Gifted show, which is based yeah. on X Men, and I was kind of like, oh, you know, whatever. But it wasn't until I was just looking at what movies were releasing here, and I was like, what's this fake movie? Because we have limited screen space here for movies because there's like mm-hmm. a renovation going on, 
And I was like, you guys are getting rid of... They're getting rid of the Equalizer 2 to have Darkest Minds. And I'm like... What? Like, there's what, a sudden what's like going running, on you know like, for like it, i don't know after years of us talking about how there's like no like smaller mid-range movies coming out yeah. where there's a sudden trend of like mid-range like sci-fi movies that you don't give a shit about coming right. out suddenly like darkest minds and there's that movie axel about like the robotic dog oh, that looks so and bad then, I, and then that yeah. then like i said the one i was talking about the kid with the gun which i wish i could remember that was called but she's like why how are these somehow sneaking into these theaters when everything else is fighting for screen space so hard and, and wide release by the way wide yeah. release and and yeah and it's just like in this case like like i would totally get if fox or especially even paramount was, i'm sorry not fox but if like warner brothers or paramount were like you know what we're never going to have an x-men but there's a lot of you know similar whatever books or whatever we can adapt but what pissed me off about this was when i looked at it and saw it was released by fox i'm like why the fuck are you ma- the why are the makers of the x-men film franchise making a fake x-men mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so i don't, I mean, I don't know We'll just shrug your say you know i, I kind of feel bad because i've actually heard a couple actually two different podcasts where you and joe uh talk about the whole acquisition and it looks like it's finally you no know, if fans or butts i guess it's happened now mm-hmm. and uh yeah that's you know for x-men fans out there i kind of feel for you because it's you know, it's it's one thing of it just being bought, but the fact that you have two movies, you know, of that universe that can't even get it released, it's just... Uh, it's, it's strange, because as Joe and I have said, and not to... We won't bog this down here, because I know we're wrapping up, but yeah. Joe, like, we're in, a, we're in an odd position of not necessarily being excited that this is happening. I mean, the merger is bad news. Like, yeah. I, I the merger sucks, because, you know, again, you're going to have one company controlling 40% of movies, which is never a good thing. But, like, on the X-Men level, like, I don't know, Joe and I were so so sure for a long time we did not want to see the X-Men leave Fox and go to MCU because we kind of liked Fox having their own franchise and it being separate. But at the same time, Fox is sitting on two X-Men movies and right. don't even know what they're doing. And and I wasn't super into Deadpool 2, so I at this point I'm kind of more okay with Fox losing X-Men because yeah. at least MCU... You know, whether you, you can debate their films all you want, but they've never made a, an atrocious film. You know, I'm, right. I am th- I think we know what we'll get. We'll get at best, you know, or not at best, but we'll get at least probably a, a, an average X-Men movie. <laughs> you know, just, yeah. you know we'll, we'll get an MCU X-Men movie where you'll go and see it. You're like, oh, that's pretty good. And then you'll move on with your life, you know. And But at least they'll be putting them out, I guess, you know, and not just holding yeah. on to them and sitting on it for a year and ordering reshoots for no reason if you're not going to yeah. release it anyway. And and obviously, I mean, we you know, if you just look at the whole list of X Men movies that Fox has had, some turn out great, some not so mm-hmm. great, some in the middle, some okay, whatever. But I gotta say, I don't know if it was kind of like the whole, if somehow the whole prospect of getting bought by Disney kind of put them in a tailspin. But I was kind of shocked because even previously when they made their most kind of crappier X Men movies. They always seem like they had a plan, even if the plan was to make a rushed, crappy movie. Mm-hmm. Now I'm just their strategy makes no sense to me, and I actually find it sad. You know what I mean? I think yeah, and I think what's odd about a company like Fox is you know like a company like Marvel. Like let's say one of the Marvel films was suddenly kind of not well, really well received, and kind of underperformed. Yeah, I mean partly it's just because they'd be they'd be chugging along anyways, and they'd probably have the next four ready to go. But I feel like they would just take that hit and move on. And Fox, I feel like I, I really feel like the reaction to Apocalypse like sent them like reeling in a way that it yeah. probably didn't need to. Like I yes, I agree Apocalypse wasn't that good, but it seems like they got like really like skittish after that. And it's like, guys, yeah. you should just like kinda take it on the chin and move on. But yeah. I don't know, they they really overreacted to that and went into like this bizarre kind of oh my god, we got a course correct and we we gotta pay more attention to new mutants now. It's like, no no no, you just made one that people didn't really like, but don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's sad. So, so, so that's that's our, you know, obviously that's some X Men related stuff, but also too for the nostalgic out there. So many great Fox franchises over the years: Planet of the Apes, Die mm-hmm. Hard, The Predator, Alien. Rest in peace, Fox. We yep. we're really, I mean, we've been talking about it for months, so we're not gonna, you know, but we're sad to see you go. But 
look forward to seeing the giant uh, John McClane mascots walking around Disney World. <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. I don't think John McClane with all his f bombs and, and, and borderline <laughs> racial slurs. I don't think that fits in the Alan Horn's moral code. At all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's what, I'm waiting for the day when the acquisition is 100 percent complete. John McClane, Predator, Alien, you're all fired from the Disney <laughs> Corporation. <laughs> you see them with their walking papers coming out. But anyway, that was a lot of fun. This was a fun topic. Yeah. I hope, you know, people have been suggesting we do different stuff. We do listen to you guys. Um, if you want to get more vocal and give us, you know, ideas or whatever, you can always hit us up. Our email is 1980smoviegraveyard at gmail.com. I need to get a better, shorter email for you guys. But um, you can always hit us up on Facebook under Hillbilly DVD Reviews. We, you know, that's, we post shit there, or I post shit there. But anyway, thanks so much for listening, guys. Hope you liked it. We'll have more shit coming soon. We're, uh, you know, got more episodes in the can, obviously. Not in the can, but in the planning stages. We'll figure out what mm-hmm. to do next. Thanks for sticking with us through our two month break. Thank you, Trev. Of course. This is a lot Thank of you. fun. Thank you for taking the time to sit here and make a list of movies that came out the year you were born. So, yeah, man. <laughs> That was a good time. Everybody, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you soon. Shovels in hand, digging up the corpses of old films in the movie graveyard. Peace.